Hello, dear friends. Good evening. I'm very happy to see you here um, on this July evening at Garage Museum. I'm really grateful to all our speakers who found time to take part in our conference. And I'm Katya Inozemtseva. I'm a senior curator of Garage Museum. So even though we are here for a scientific conference, it's not exactly scientific because today we are going to become witnesses and participants of a special event. This is the second part of our project that uh, we thought about um, uh, quite a long time ago. And this project is called I Am, and this is going to be episode two. So we started this project in June, in June uh, when uh, one of our spaces of Garage Museum turned into a laboratory. And this was uh, an area for uh, continuous um, uh, work uh, where different artists, scientists and researchers were working together and um, they were producing not uh, just artifacts and um, Actually, it looked uh, very anti-museum, anti-institutional, because we didn't expect any result, results from the artists uh, that we were working with in June. So our museum space has turned into a laboratory and I can say that you could feel energy of resistance. It was quite spontaneous to institutional formats uh, and you could feel it throughout the whole project. So together with our artists uh, and other project participants, uh, we were thinking about the stability of uh, different museum forms and formats, about the physical reality of space. And the second part of our IM project uh, is uh, going to take place tonight and it's going to be a series of talks uh, and um, it's going to be about different subjects, uh, different uh, ideas related to the newest museology and newest media. And, uh, some, and it's very interesting to see from the narrative uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to all the speakers that agreed to take part in this initiative. So we're going to speak about the future as the idea, as the language that is suitable uh, for um, telling about future. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence, about uh, imagination, aesthetic taste, uh, Kantian ability of thinking. So we are going to discuss how the um, museum exists, uh, not just the Museum of Contemporary Art, but all other kinds of museums. And we're going also to um, touch upon preservation of digital art because it eliminated the category of historical time and uh, finally we um, would finish with the log with its uh, logics uh, do, uh, and uh, it was a very interesting formulation do you agree to digital immortality and then uh, on the 19th we are going to open the final episode, episode three of this project, and it will be a total audio and visual installation of uh, um, Ryoji Ikeda, Japanese musician and mathematician by background, and uh, it's going to take place here as well in the space of our lab. Even though we are tired of traditional museum formats, uh, and uh, that's why we are going to have uh, um, a music performance by Ryoji Ikeda on, on the 18th, and this will be the beginning 
beginning of this third episode. Actually, he already visited garage, uh, the old uh, uh, garage building. So um, Riozzi, uh, together with uh, Pompidou Center, um, uh, prepared this project. And so it's going to be a Russian premiere um, here. And Ikeda uh, basically is uh, turning mathematical code into uh, um, uh, visual experience, uh, sensory experience, uh, bringing together all sorts of audiences, uh, trying to ne neutralize all sorts of real boundaries as well as phantom boundaries. And um, I hope that this uh, three-part uh, structure um, would be interesting and you will enjoy uh, today's event. And um, I would like uh, to appeal and refer to new sensitivity with regard to new forms of art in uh, post-digital time. So this is my introduction and I'm happy to introduce the first speaker, Anne Denka Betke, who is a futurist and sociologist working at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. She um, has uh, been working there for five years and Anna is the leading specialist and speaker of this uh, institute. She coordinates global uh, scanning network project and is part of editing team of um, Institute's um, uh, Scenario magazine where she has published uh, uh, many articles uh, and I would like to um, uh, thank uh, the embassy uh, uh, of the Kingdom of Denmark in Moscow uh, who uh, supported us uh, and brought uh, this valuable speaker tonight. Anna, you're welcome. Thank you very much. I understood almost everything, got Good. everything, I hope. Um, Yes, I have been so lucky as I have been asked to talk about the future from maybe a little broader perspective than I usually do. And when I say talk about the future, this means that I'm going to introduce you to some of the tools that we use when we at my workplace talk about the future with companies, with governments, with municipalities, and also just individuals um, between ourselves. Because the future may seem like a very fluffy concept, but actually it exists a lot closer to us. It's, it's, it's a much bigger part of our everyday and our actions and our reasons for acting the way we do than we think about um, the future is both our hopes and our fears and our desires, and it's the developments that we fear will happen, and it's the dreams that we hope will come true. But as I said, I will introduce you to some pretty concrete tools um, as to create a common platform to talk about the future, both with institutions and with each other, because that's one of the key parts of talking about the future. We need a common... Um, Platform, as I said, and a common vocabulary. All right. Just quickly, a little bit about my background. This is the institute I'm from. It's um, the second oldest think tank in the world. We were founded in 69. And there was one in Silicon Valley, the Institute of the Future, founded two months before us. So we are actually the second oldest think tank. But Future Studies was very, very popular and very up and coming in the 1950s and 60s, particularly in the United States, where this president was known for optimism and believing in the future and, and like, accepting change. And he wanted change to come really fast because change was going to make society a better place. And this is our founder, uh, Torkel Christensen, who was a classical economist. He had a very classical, very pragmatic way of thinking about the future. 
He was um, general secretary of the OECD, and he was the minister of finance in Denmark. And as many economists at that time, and maybe also today, he thought that the future could very much be put into boxes. For example, if you look at demographics, if you know how many baby boys are born in Moscow today, we will sort of know how many men will be 50 years old in 50 years. If we account for deaths and traffic and statistics and all other kind of things, we can look at demographics and we can say something with quite certainty about demographics. But then in the 80s and 90s, they started hiring sociologists and anthropologists and psychologists and everyone else who could nuance this very pragmatic way of looking at the future. And I'm one of the sociologists uh, who work at the Institute. Any other sociologists here? <laughs> no? Can you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Good. <laughs> just, ma just making sure. You're very quiet, very nice audience. All right. The discipline of future studies that I'm bringing to the table here, of course, it's not an exact science. It's made up of, of a lot of social sciences, a lot of economy, a lot of statistics. But in theory and also in reality is actually a study of something that is very human nature. Because we all, as I said, have a relationship with the future and it's, we have to have a relationship with the future. It's actually an extremely crucial, essential way of adapting to change. Change that is happening all the time, both societal, in our family, at our jobs, and the way we consume and as individuals. It's the way we adapt to things that happen to us. And the relationship we have with the future is a very fundamental part of how we act and how we work as individuals. And also how societies and organizations work. work. Um, so the first tool I'll introduce you to is the time perspective, time, time, blah, 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 the time perception one. Um, and it's about how people are divided in our, the way we work with it. We divide them into three boxes, three time perceptions. And uh, we've done its large survey that the Institute do every 10, year, every 10 years. And we did the first survey in 1994, the second one was in 2004, and then we did another survey right after the financial crisis in 2014. And we grouped people into three different time percep perceptions. And they're meant to be archetypes, like no, no one in here is, is really one of these archetypes, but we might have a dominant archetype in us. And it's all about, as I said, the relationship we have with the future is a very fundamental way of a very fundamental part of how we act and how we adapt to change. Because we see the world the way we are and the way we look at change, not the way the world is. And it's very... It's a key to understanding and actually talking to other people about the future if they have a different perspective on the future than we have. But let me get down to it. Sorry, I talk and talk and talk. <laughs> the present, this, the present-oriented people. We have three kinds of time perceptions: the present-oriented, the past-oriented, and the future-oriented people. And the present ones. Let me describe a project group for you to maybe make this a little more concrete. If you have a project group. There's the present-oriented people. They, have, uh, they, they don't really see change before it happens. Like, let me see it before it happens. They don't really believe that something will really change before they've seen it. They're also not really sure that the good old days were as good as everyone says they were. Maybe they weren't. Maybe today is just the best times we had so far. So they have to focus on their task in these project groups. This is what they do. Then there are the future-oriented people. They cannot wait for the future to happen. The future just needs to come right now, because it will be better. Everything will be better in the future. Today is boring. The old days were also boring, but they sort of just, you know, it, it happened, but let's, let's move on. So they have all the new ideas. They're really updated in the project group with everything that goes on. They read all the new reports. They have all the new gadgets. Um, they know everything that's going on, but they're not really, maybe they sometimes stray a little bit away from the actual project they're working on. Then we have the past-oriented people. And no one really wants to be in this category, but they're actually some of the most important people in a project group, in a work, in a job. Because they remember that maybe some ideas that we had last time we had a meeting were actually well, 
well thought through. Maybe we should pick those ideas up again. Maybe we should update them and they're actually good enough. So it's not one thing that's better than the other of these time perceptions. We need all of them in society and we also, also have a little bit of all of these time perceptions in us. That's one tool. I have more if you thought this was boring. If some of you move on, if you're future oriented and just want the next tool, the next tool. All right, this is just a quick cartoon to illustrate the time perceptions, because cartoons are also funny. And this is, everyone in this room has probably been on both sides of this table. It says, um, the boss here says, your proposal is innovative. Unfortunately, we won't be able to use, this cause we use it because we never tried anything like this before. And it's a very direct way of illustrating uh, time perceptions. This one it has all the great ideas, but this one doesn't really want to implement them because we really never really tried anything like this before. So these, yeah, there was illustration about why we look at perceptions. All right, so why talking about the future is also a key element of um, my presentation here, because the thing is, we need to be better at adapting to change. And this is what these tools about talking about the future can help us do. And uh, being resilient is a buzzword that's been around in consultancy, in psychology for decades. But it's probably more important than it has ever been because it, change happens a little faster than it used to. At least it feels like change is happening a little faster than it used to. And resilience, and to be resilient both as an individual and as an institution, means that um, you react to change in a more adaptive way. And you sort of, you grab the change, the stress and the pressure and the disruption, and you bounce forward instead of bouncing back or bouncing, not bouncing at all. You grab the change and grab the disruption and you sort of, it help, help you, helps you move forward. Yep. This is actually one of the things that we work the most with when we work with larger companies. We work with resilience concepts and actually how do we grab these changes that are happening? How do they use the stress and the disruption in their advantage? And they start with future studies, which is the radar. We have these three tools. It's the foresight. They scan and monitor every disruption that they think will happen and will affect their industry, their sector, or their company. They do that with megatrends, which I will introduce in a second. So we make sure they have all of these three tools with them when being in a resilient organization. So you need to scan and you need to be super aware of your surroundings as an organization. Then you need uh, proper risk management. You need to have procedures. You need to be prepared to the different disruptions that are happening to you. That's the shield. Um, the, yes, we have a, one of our directors at the Institute used to work in the Pentagon, so he always likes to use military terms for anything you use. So that is why I became the radar, the shield, and the sword, even for risk management, uh, boring stuff. We try to spice it up with weapons. Um, so the sword is actually one of the most important part of <laughs> this. Yes, actually, yes, uh, the sword is one of the most important part of being important parts of being resilient because this is where you're being proactive and you are actually acting before the change is happening. So it's not just about reacting to the change, but being proactive um, towards the change. You can ask me questions about all of these super complicated things after I will also be around and I think there's a bit of Q&A after my presentation. You got your picture? Good. <laughs> so part of the radar is uh, using the mega trends that, um, that the Institute has established. It's not an exact science and we actually disagree quite a lot of them in the Institute, but we also, I'm a sociologist, I work with economists, we have psychologists, we have some, we have historians, we have someone who studied literature, we even have an astrophysicist um, working for us and then we have all the business people who are really aware of what's going on in the financial sector. So we don't always agree and all of these megatrends, but we use this set of 14 megatrends to make a really thorough analysis for an industry or a sector. So the thing is with megatrends, to 
be established as a mega trend, you need to have been, we need to be very, very certain of them. These are actually what we call, instead of mega trends, we can call them certainties. And everything else is uncertain. So these are the certainties. These are the things we are very, very sure. These are development we are very sure will continue. And that's what defines a mega trend. So it needs to have been going on for at least 10 to 15 years, which also means it will probably continue for another number of years. A lot of these have been going on for much longer. For example, um, the demographic development. This includes aging of society and it includes urbanization. If urbanization has been going on, it's been accelerating for the past 15 years, but really maybe it has been going on for the past 300 years. And if I'm, if I'm being really cheeky here, maybe urbanization has actually been happening for 10,000 years, if we really want to you know, look back into time. So we, we are very, very sure that urbanization will continue, that more people will live in urban areas in, in 10 years than they did uh, yesterday. So we are very sure, even though there are lots of counter trends, lots of uh, trends that go the other way, we are very sure the mega trends will pull uh, the whole world in their direction. All right. Also, globalization is an interesting one to pull out here because even though maybe the world is going back and forth when it comes to global polarization, globalization on a political level, but then again, I'm standing here in a conference in Moscow and uh, maybe some of you will add me on LinkedIn tomorrow. Maybe it's something else that was happening that is adding to globalization in a whole different level than it used to. There's different layers of all of these megatrends. All right. Individualization is one I'm just pulling out because uh, and, and uh, highlighting here because it's also one of the mega trends that I'm often asked questions about. Like, are we really becoming more individualized, and or are we are we really um, not you know focusing on society anymore and our common good and everything? But yes, we are becoming more and more individualized and. I can illustrate this by saying we will never go back to mass customization. No product will ever be uh, uh, offered as uh, this one type of product anymore. Probably, definitely, most definitely not. But come up to me and challenge me on this. Uh, ask me after if you disagree. <laughs> one of the points is, though, no one can hide from a mega trend. It's global. Maybe somewhere it's going faster than others, but the reason why no one can hide from a mega trend is that it's already here. And this is a pretty famous science fiction quote, but it actually describes a mega trend absolutely brilliant. It's a um, science fiction author called William Gibson who said, um, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Which means you can see the future or you can see the changes and developments that's going to happen somewhere in the world and then you know they're coming. All right. The other part of what I brought here is what I've been most exciting, most excited to talk about because this is the spaces and the narratives and these are some of the things I don't really get to take out to bigger companies but that I can bring to Garage because Garage is really open-minded and interested. And the thing with spaces and narratives when talking about the future is that we should never forget that we actually already have a lot of existing narratives of the future that we are constantly referencing and thinking about when we are talking about the future. We're not as conscious about it as we should be. For example, when we're talking about surveillance, Everyone brings up Big Brother or 1984, that's so Big Brother, that's so 1984. So they're bringing up an existing science fiction narrative in order to talk about a specific development. Also, maybe when talking about robots, people, people say, <laughs> when talking about robots, people say, oh, it's like the droids from Star Wars, or they reference any kind of robots that they know from science fiction. So they're associating everything they do and what they talk about the future. They have a common platform already, which is the sci-fi narratives. All right. Here is a, a drawing that I'm always showing, because this is one of the spaces and the illustrations of, um, of the future that has 
has one of the most interesting illustrations of the future that I have ever seen. It's actually a real illustration. It's from 1956. It's from an American magazine. When in, I'm going back now to when future studies was founded in the 50s and the, you know, people started thinking about the future in this very specific way. There was this magazine. They were also very fascinated by the millennia then, by the year 2000. They were extremely fascinated by this everywhere in the world. So. A magazine um, asked a lot of uh, city planners, they asked some sociologists, some psychologists, and everyone else they could think of to make an, uh, a description of the typical American family in the year 2000. And maybe take a good look at it, because they got some of the things right. <laughs> and usually I would ask in the room, what did they get right? Um, but uh, I'm not really sure how it's working <laughs> with the translation, but... The thing they got right was the flat screen televisions. They got the Skyping, maybe, sorry I'm, if I'm blocking some of it. This is Skype or video chat. There's some supersonic laundry. We don't exactly have that, but we have much more efficient laundry machines than they used to have that. We don't have um, escalators in our buildings either. But then they got a lot of things wrong, which is the more interesting question here. What were they able to predict, that's very often the technological developments, because this is very linked to the desires and very linked to what do we want, then we build it. So what did they get wrong? They got the gender roles completely wrong, at least to some degree. There's mom in the kitchen, grandma setting the table, dad is coming home. Uh, so that's one thing that was really hard to predict. Then there's the, the smoking, the granddad is smoking right next to the grandchild. I'm betting mom, she would be very angry today if he did that. And then there's something about the obesity epidemic. <laughs> and an average American family do not look like this today. So the health trends, the obesity, they couldn't predict. They couldn't predict the change, changing gender roles. Also, if you look outside, the family lives in the countryside, so they couldn't really predict that people would move to the city in the degree that they would. My point being, the social developments seem much harder to describe and to predict than the technological ones. It is one lesson or something, key point that I, wish, or that I want, hope you will take with you. There's one example of someone who actually predicted some of the social changes right. Do you know what is this? Good. <laughs> um, it's a show that very much insisted on predicting some of the societal changes and bringing it up because they have been so right on so many points and we're not even aware of it. Actually, I've done several, I use this, I use this in presentations even for very serious big companies to show that sometimes they can get it right. Maybe some of you already know this, but there were two pilots on the command bridge. Uh, there was a Japanese and a Russian. And this was mid-Cold War. This was 1966 till 69. He was introduced in the second season in 67. But they had a Russian pilot on an American command ship in mid-Cold War. And then they had a Japanese pilot running the ship. It's not even 30 years after Pearl Harbor. And... Then they have her, Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura, a black woman on the command bridge. This was before it was allowed for black and white to marry in the United States. They could marry in some states, but definitely not in all states. She was an actress from musical theater who was actually not particularly interested in playing her role in this like, really weird show. It was not very popular back when it was uh, were first sent in television. But Martin Luther King himself asked her to please, please stay on the show because your role is so important for the civil rights movement that people can see that a black woman can have a command post. She's a lieutenant on a command bridge in 1960s. Today it's more realistic. It's still a white man who is the captain, which is probably very much as it is today. But they dared, and they were criticized. Everyone thought it was super unrealistic. What are they thinking? Um, isn't, it'll never be like that, but it's closer to what a command bridge would probably look like today than it did in the 60s. All right, this is the last photo that I have um, of tools. And it's a Danish photo collective, Sarah, Peter, and Tobias. They are also showing some familiar futures. Yes, I will round it up. I'm so sorry. 
Um, I just have so much to say about the future. <laughs> it's, um, they take photos of, this is called the mukbang. They take photos of social change and sort of helping people to talk about it. It's an exhibition in London that's on right now. So they're photographing so technological development. This is um, the mukbang videos. It's a Korean YouTuber who actually uh, posts and eats her meal in front of 300,000 followers. They don't judge, they just photograph that this is happening. And then there's this robot called the Dreamer, who is from a uh, university in Texas, and it's supposed to be illustrating, and it's, it's programmed to react, maybe some of you will say more about this later, but it's supposed to react to human emotion, and it's supposed to help us understand how technology should react to human emotions, and help us understand how do we want technology to react to human, in, human emotion. This is another example of how familiar futures, how science fiction futures, how futures that are not already there are being depicted in art and will help us talk about what developments do we want and which don't we want. So, when talking about the future, I've been trying to introduce you extremely briefly to a few tools. There's the time perception one, that no matter who you talk to, people see the world the way they are and not the world is. And it's probably very different from your own time perception. Then there's the resilience one. We need to talk about the future because we need to talk about the stress and the disruptions that will happen. It will help the adaption to the disruptions and the change. We have some certainties, the things we are absolutely sure of that will happen, or maybe 99% sure will happen, are the megatrends. And then we can already use the existing narratives and the art that is existing and that we're already using when we're talking about the future. We can use that and maybe use it more consciously. All right, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to, uh, to mention that uh, if you have questions for Anna, you can ask your questions right now. Okay, sure. Um, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I was just wondering if you can give a few more examples of your research that is derived very much from contemporary art, and maybe in percentage, how much you actually... Um, or, or like, I'm just curious how much it comes from science fiction and contemporary art and sort of um, about this notion of artists um, being able or science fiction writers being able to sort of pick out and feel the, the change and the coming change uh, perhaps much faster than um, other um, yeah, spheres can. Thank you. Thank you. I, I cannot give you a percentage, but I did write my master's thesis, uh, think almost 10 years ago, about when uh, articles in mainstream newspapers use, this is the best answer I can give you, but I, I took a whole bunch of articles about new discoveries, new technological discoveries in Danish newspapers, and I looked for what references did they use, and did they use science fiction references, and then uh, to what degree did they use them. And I found that almost every article in Danish mainstream newspapers used some kind of science fiction reference when describing a technological change. And this could be like, it's Terminator-like, or it's Blaster from Star Wars-like, or it's uh, a tractor beam, it's like the one from Star Trek. They would almost always describe, and I'm not giving you a percentage, but maybe 90, maybe 90, don't quote me. Um, they would use some type, some type of existing, uh, familiar future to describe a uh, development. I don't know the Russian numbers, <laughs> sorry. Um, the, the problem here is that it's not mainstream familiar, the contemporary art thing. We do have some very interesting photo products, like photo productions or uh, and exhibitions, like the one they have, where they are photographing these technological um, discoveries happening. And they are sort of taking a step, uh, they're beginning to discuss like where do we want it to go uh, with like this photo exhibition, uh, I suppose it goes falls under contemporary art, uh, or if, you, if, we, if we wanted to. Um, it forces us to talk about where do, how do we want this robot to react, to, and do we want this robot to react to human emotion at all before um, 
it suddenly we can buy it on the market and, and we can go to a supermarket and everyone can get their own robot. So maybe it can help us a little bit, but it's not as much out there as it should be. Thank you. Еще вопросы? Анна, спасибо, спасибо большое. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Я думаю, что если эти вопросы появятся впоследствии, то мы можем в каком-то формате продолжить после. Спасибо за... Я бы сказала, довольно э, точное, емкое э, определение того, что э, ну, вообще довольно тяжело подается э, артикуляции и э, формулировке. Э, сейчас же я приглашаю, э, приглашаю на нашу импровизированную сказать, сцену э, Льва Мановича, который э, расскажет и э, э, представит размышления о том, э, о самом, кажется, э, емком воплощении образа будущего мира, о котором судачат многие, но, кажется, немногие понимают, что же есть это на самом деле, об искусственном интеллекте и о том, как это самое нечто влияет на наше поведение, влияет на процессы и механизмы воображения и на художественное производство в том числе. Лев Манович, мне кажется, все те, кто находится в этой аудитории, для них не требует специального представления. Тем не менее, упомяну, что Манович директор Cultural Analytics Lab, доктор компьютерных наук, профессор городского университета Нью-Йорка, Института медиа, архитектуры, дизайна «Стрелка», Европейской высшей школы САСФЭ и приглашенный преподаватель кафедры медиа, культуры и коммуникации Нью-Йоркского университета. Это еще далеко не все. Лев, прошу. Спасибо, что пришли. Я не знаю, как вы по такой жаре дошли. Это только в России вот люди могут прийти на культурные события, даже когда жарко. Вот. Уже все в других странах все уже сидят по бассейнам. Вот. Вы знаете, это будет по-английски, потому что мне очень ну, серьезно сказали, что ТЭД 25 минут, ни секунды больше. Я не могу так говорить долго, красиво по-русски. Вот. Поэтому я буду читать вот. и слайды, вот. и кликер, и секундомер. Вот. Так что, когда 25 минут, просто э, застрелите меня из Калашникова, вот, чтобы больше времени не, не тратил. Хорошо? Так, поехали. Что? А, ну ладно. Хорошо. Так. Окей, okay, поехали. Writing in 1842, Ada Lovelace imagines that in the future a Babbage's analytical engine, i.e., the first general purpose programmable computer will be able to create complex music. In 1917, novel by famous Russian writer Viktor Pelevin, set in the late 21st century, will narrate itself as an algorithm, solving crimes and writing novels about them. Today we exist somewhere between these two visions of cultural AI, artificial intelligence. Algorithms are frequently used to write music, but we don't really understand human semantic world and human semantic meanings. And the way we later will ever happen is not at all obvious. The original vision of AI was about automation of cognition. But today AI also plays a crucial role in culture, increasingly influencing our aesthetic choices, behaviors, and imagination. For example, it is used to recommend photos, uh, videos, music, and other media, as well as people we should follow on social networks, to automatically beautify selfies and edit user photos to fit norms of good photography, to generate characters in computer games, and so on. Mm. Left, Vera Molnar, one of the first computer artists, the, probably the first woman computer artist, untitled, computer drawing, 1971. On the left, on the right, Manfred Moore, uh, also an early computer artist. Uh, this work is called Random Walk, 1969. The algorithms were used by an artistic creation by selected artists since 1960s, as you can see here. But today, what I would call industrial scale, cultural AI, is built into devices and services used by billions of people. Instead of an instrument of a single artistic imagination, AI became a mechanism for influencing imaginations of billions of people, including all yours. 
if you're using mobile phones. Gathering and aggregating data about cultural behaviors of multitudes is used to model the aesthetic self, predicting our future aesthetic decisions and likes, and potentially, perhaps, having danger of guiding us towards the choices preferred by the majority. This integration of AI into everyday cultural lives of billions of people via digital devices and services raises big questions about the future, in my case, the future of culture and taste. And I will try to address uh, briefly these questions in this talk. So this is a screenshot of uh, Google Analytics from my own website, manage.net, and it illustrates how AI is even, you know, you, you can encounter it every day. So this is traffic to my website for the last month, and you can see how Google Analytics uh, supposed that using AI. Of course, we don't know if it's AI or not, because today everything is called AI, but definitely using some algorithms have detected some unusual pattern and I think the, like it forecasted, right? Expected that on June 12, 23rd, uh, the number of page views for this page would be about five, and it was 16, right? Mm -hmm. And it's doing it, right, to billions of people on every single page. So that's what I mean by industrial scale AI. In the original version of AI in the 50s and 60s, the goal would be to teach a computer to perform a range of cognitive tasks. In this vision, a computer would simulate many operations of a single human mind. They include playing chess, solving mathematical problems, understanding written and spoken language, and recognizing kind of images. <coughs> 60 years later, AI became a key instrument of modern economies deployed to make them more efficient, secure, and predictable. For example, automatic analyzing medical images, making decisions on consumer loans, filtering job applications, detecting fraud, and so on. And uh, I think culturally and publicly, AI is also seen as an enhancer of everyday life, saving us time and effort. For example, when we use the voice interface on the phone, uh, Alisa, rather than typing. But it's not so easy to answer a question, what exactly is AI today? Because the term has been so much hyped in the last five years. Today, computers and phones and other digital devices perform endless similarly intelligent operations. For example, your phone keyboard gradually adapts to your typing style. Your phone may also monitor your application usage and adjust your work in the background to save battery. There are thousands of such not very glamorous but intelligent operations at work in different parts of IT universe. Therefore, in one sense, AI is now everywhere and we shouldn't even talk about it. Now, but some AI roles, of course, attract more attention. For example, you know, Google Smart Reply function that suggests automatic email replies. Already last year, it was used in 10% of all email replies for people who use inbox application from Google. But many other roles, as I pointed out, operate in a kind of gray every day of digital society. So why some intelligent tasks that computers can accomplish are seen as real AI and others are not, right? So observers and historians of AI field talk about what they call the AI effect. So here's a quote about this effect from you know, one of many people who wrote about it. When, when we know how a machine does something intelligent, it it's no longer is regarded as intelligent. In other words, after AI field solves some problem, and the solution is implemented in the industry, it's no longer seen as a part of the field. So paradoxically, we tend to only see challenging and not yet solved problems as belonging to AI. Right? So whatever AI, what is AI? Whatever hasn't been solved yet. Right? Uh, and this creates the impression that AI research has not been successful during its long history. So now let's talk about aesthetic AI, what I call aesthetic AI. Right? So what maybe hasn't been or basically hasn't been discussed a lot, is that AI now already plays equally important role in our cultural lives and behaviors, increasingly automating the process of aesthetic creation. So when we create new cultural artifacts or experiences, and also aesthetic choices. So, uh, because maybe you know, like one of my last books was a whole book about Instagram, like I'm really into digital photography now, I think it's the latest new media. 
And um, I will start by giving you some examples that we I used in photography. Um, and right, so I will get to it with one of the illustrations. So I'll just read some examples, which kind of organize in two categories. One is selecting from existing content. So we are helping us to select from a larger database. For example, image sharing services and marketplaces use AI to predict the content of images and assign keywords to them. Instagram Explore screen recommends images and videos to each user based on a combination of many factors. It's not as simple as it will recommend more things you've seen in the past. There are many, many factors at work, including some automatic aesthetic ratings. Yelp, right, automatically selects best photos to illustrate numerous businesses at least, and I'm sorry, but I can see with my list of examples is a bit US-centric, so I promise to correct it in the future. Today, I probably got my Visa card from Sberbank, so I'm in the process of versification, so I'll make sure I'll replace all these all this foreign examples of native ones for next time. Now, okay, so what you see on the screen is another great example. It's a role application from company IM. It happens to be in Brooklyn, but Brooklyn is not really part of America, so it's okay. So automatically rates aesthetic quality of user photos, and then we have also marketplace, like an image kind of sharing place where you can sell your photos, which also assigns such scores to the submitted photos. So we can see where one photo was rated 85%, and of course AI also automatically detected you know, types of content, portrait summer and sunglasses. And then I like this photo a lot, but AI thinks it's only 40% aesthetically successful. And uh, why, you know, that's another talk. It will take more than 25 minutes. I kind of pretty much have an idea why, but. <laughs> okay, so more examples. So the second part, the second set of examples is like more like how do AI help us to create, edit new content. So photo applications can automatically modify captured photos according to norms of good photography. Many of you perhaps are using kind of application which help you to beautify your selfies. Uh, Photoshop 9.9, 9.1 uses the AI, it's new function to automatically select objects from the background. Uh, phone cameras analyze 3D layout of a scene, embryo backgrounds and portraits and selfies. And then uh, perhaps the latest in the kind of camera war is development introduced in Huawei May 10 phone camera, released in October last year. So it uses AI to analyze all the time what the camera is seeing. Right? So you don't have to press a button, it, the camera is looking at the world and constantly analyzing it and detecting up to like 13 different types of scene. Uh, so whatever it is, it classifies into one from a number of scenes, scene types. Okay, so here is from a review of this camera. And then it selects appropriate parameters for capturing a given photo. And this has happened even before you press a button. When you press a button, right, it, cost, it instantly captures the photo because even before you press a button, it already adjusted all the parameters to fit the scene. Uh, let me show you another interesting experimental kind of application. Um, so there are many applications that are in photography that are emerging, haven't been yet implemented in products, but it's coming. So for example, I, 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 sorry, I am engineers describe experiment uh, where every system learn the styles of different photo curators. Okay, garage curators, pay attention. Okay. <laughs> From only 20, 20 sample photos, uh, so you give like system 20 sample photos, you say I like these photos, and then the system says, okay, here's like billions of photos, so I find other photos you may like to curate in your exhibitions, right? Uh, and here um, I'm demonstrating, that's from a Google blog, it's a system Google design that mimics the skills of professional photographer, such as selecting a photo suitable for editing, cropping it, and ap applying filters. So what you see in, the, in the, this row, right, in the left row, left, right, no, left row, it's like two photographs, the system automatically selected as potentially good ones to edit from Google Street View. And then uh, using machine learning, it kind of uh, learned how to make them better, right? So this is like a filter mask that applied, and the right you have results, and you know, it doesn't look, I think, very amazing yet, but this is just the beginning, so you can see how it enhanced contrast and made the sky more dramatic, and this is again completely automatic. Uh, so it's not simply applying a filter, right? It's really kind of figuring out how to enhance each individual photograph. So, um, so I gave you a bunch of examples from photography, but of course, there are lots of culture uses of AI besides images, for example, music recommendations, 
or uh, you know, there are social networks, right, such as Facebook, which will automatically create short videos in a range of styles. Uh, now designers start to experiment of using AI to create new fashion items and styles. As the adoption of AI in culture keeps growing, I think what may happen is what happened with AI in the last 70 years, where research in AI help us to redefine what is kind of unique or help us to understand what's unique about human intelligence, right? Because AI was able to do some things, but not ours. So perhaps as this aesthetic AI becomes bigger and bigger, we'll be able to understand what is really unique about art and aesthetics and aesthetic appreciation, right? What are the things which AI can do, right? And, and so as opposed to seeing the fact that maybe like Google system can't make amazing photos yet, like Cartier-Bresson, that's maybe the most useful part, because maybe it will help us to understand what is so amazing about Cartier-Bresson, you know, or another example. So I tried to create a kind of tax, you know, temporary taxonomy, uh, 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 which uh, talks about different types of AI, cultural AI, which exists already today, and I think we'll have many more examples of it in the future, so you know it's coming. And of course, it's just one possible taxonomy about ours. So there are kind of four categories, right? So one, what I would call selecting. Right, because we live in a kind of big data society uh, where you know, there is lots of music, you know, cultural events in Moscow, photographs on Instagram. There are too many items for us to process, so AI uh, has been implemented over the last 10 years to kind of help us choose, and it can uh, exist in the form of search, right? So, for example, Google search or Yandex search, in the form of discovery, curation, recommendation, filtering. So the second thing is uh, it's strictly about advertising, so it's targeting content. So in this case, the system right, selects particular ads, which ads, of course, are also cultural artifacts, perhaps most interesting cultural artifacts of our time, uh, and shows them to us, right? And then the third one is assistance in creation. So assistance means the final decisions are still made by human being, uh, but AI helps us. And if we think of AI in a, as a kind of intelligent and biological sense, perhaps we can call this function participation, so AI participates in content creation. And the fourth one is like fully autonomous creation. And I think it's important to realize that this fully autonomous creation already is widely used in culture. For example, AI composes music tracks in a particular style, and I think Sony released at least one album of AI music. Right? AI is used by major uh, newspapers, and news portals to write business and sport news article. AI creates visualizations from given data sets. AI designs websites, generates email responses, and so on. Okay. So one trend which we see in these examples is a movement towards gradual automation, seeming full of human aesthetic decisions. Recommendation engines suggesting what we should watch, listen, read, right and where, whom we should meet, and what we should, what we should tell them. Devices and services automatically adjust aesthetics of captured media to fit certain criteria. Software rates aesthetic quality of our photos. This development raises big questions about the future of culture, and one question which has been concerning in particular, because in a way it fits with earlier questions which people started to ask a lot in the 90s, like what is the cultural effect of globalization, right? Does globalization going to decrease cultural diversity? And there has been many other kind of factors, but now we have a new factor playing into it, which is the integration of AI into cultural products and services. So to me, maybe one of the most interesting questions is does this gradual automation leads to decrease in aesthetic diversity over time? But why, right? Why we have to be negative about AI? Just because we're like in a garage museum, right? and we read some, read some Marxist critical theory from 20th century, right? This is new century, forget, right? forget what you've read in schools. Uh, so why maybe, maybe actually the reality is different. Maybe the automation with AI is going to increase uh, cultural diversity. Now, it may sound a bit abstract, so let me illustrate what it means for image culture. So how do we rewrite this question for image culture, a question of cultural diversity? For example, you can ask if automatic enhancements and edits with mobile cameras and photo sharing services apply to user photos make them less diverse aesthetically. Right? Because we all basically try to make your photos into good photos, which means 
you know, they're going to be sharp, they're going to be contrasty, and so on and so forth. We will further AI integration use of photography devices lead to standardization of, public, of photo imagination. To search and recommendation engines or uh, parts of applications such as Instagram Explore screen, you know, when you go to Instagram, one of the screens kind of shows you, right, interesting photographs to look at, it's called Explore screen. So the services tend to show the same images or maybe many variations of certain image types with certain content or maybe only images of certain professional aesthetics, so we're not going to show you bad photos. So in other words, do we show same types of images to lots of people while diminishing the diversity of what we could have been seen instead? Is it possible to actually make like bad photographs today from a professional point of view? And because lots of, lots of great 20th century photography is not sharp, right? It's not contrasty. It's kind of bad from, uh, from this point of view. But immediately it's important to think about our forces, our developments, which may counteract this trend and in fact may lead to more diversity. For example, today digital cameras and photo applications also have lots of functions for customizing image aesthetics, more than your camera in the past. On my camera, which in the moment happens to be Fuji E3, I can choose shutter speed, aperture, ISO, desired levels of highlights and shadow tone, color density, sharpening, grain, dynamic range, noise reduction, film simulation filters, and so on. So I have more choices, right? Free photo editing apps such as Snapseed, right? Used by many people to prepare their photos for Instagram or other networks also offer a large number of tools which are kind of, in a way, make it very similar now to Photoshop or Lightroom. Over time, the trend is that phone cameras and photo editing apps have been adding more and more controls, and lots of these apps are now free. Therefore, while gradual AI integration into phone cameras and sharing sites may contribute to decrease in static diversity, the gradual addition of more and more controls to cameras and photo apps may have an opposite effect. Um, let's see, how much time do I have left, if anything? Zero? Five minutes, let's say. Ah? Five minutes. Oh my god, that's great. Okay, uh, let's, uh, okay, let me actually, that's fine, like I've done about 70% of the paper, you know, you can read it online. Uh, I can tell you a beer, so let me show you, let me show you kind of slides now. Okay. Uh, this was supposed to illustrate something, doesn't matter. So, um, so the interesting question is, right, so when we talk about AI and other cultural and social economic forces contributing to increase or decrease in static diversity, well, can we actually measure this, right? Can we measure the amount of static uh, diversity in uh, certain forms of digital culture, be it photography or maybe in non-digital culture such as fashion? And uh, how would we do it? Well, it so happens that uh, for the last uh, 12 years, hundreds of thousands of computer and social scientists have been quantitatively analyzing massive samples of contemporary digital culture and asking not exactly this question, but basically measuring right, various parameters, features, and changes in digital culture, including looking at billions of posts and user interactions on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Flickr, Pinterest, etc., etc., Yelp, creative networks such as Behance, and so on. They develop many quantitative measures that describe or attempt to some aspects of culture, such as, for example, describing structure of sharing and social networks, mathematically, or even describing, again, mathematically, uniqueness and originality of images in an image database. Right? So, for example, right, when you look at like, you know, like Instagram, you say, oh, this image is really unique. Right? I haven't seen it before. Obviously, your brain is making some right, judgments. Well, it is possible, in fact, to develop algorithms which will do something like that, perhaps. So within this paradigm, we can also propose some measures of aesthetic diversity and apply them to some cultural areas and types of media. And because we now have large records of user media going back to at least 2004, right? for example, in 2014, Flickr released a data set of 100 million uh, public photographs of Creative Commons license, which was covering 10 years, and with Instagram we can go back to 2010, right? We can actually ask these kind of very precise questions and track them over the uh, last 13 years. 
So uh, among all these papers, I only found one which directly was talking about diversity. So it's this paper uh, written by kind of computer scientists and musicians and published in 2015. And what we've done uh, is we basically analyze changes in diversity of music, looking at kind of popular music in America you know, over a few decades. And uh, yeah, you don't have to read the small tie, but basically we said, well, we can measure diversity in like different ways. So here are four different measurements looking at four different things. And you know, according to some measures, the diversity is increasing or decreasing. But I think what's interesting is you get these very kind of gradual changes, right? So obviously, there's something where which you can measure, and this is something which is changing gradually. So uh, I will just very briefly uh, say this, right? So when we're thinking about how to measure diversity, so we can understand you know, how if AI is going to affect society, of course, we have also talked about different types of diversity. So for example, we can talk about diversity of content, which is subjects, techniques, and aesthetics in the case of photos. So what is the diversity of photos people create and show on Instagram today in Moscow versus, for example, last year? Uh, and we can look at this in a cultural field or in a network such as Instagram or geographic area, like Moscow versus St. Petersburg and so on. But we can also look at diversity in user choices, right? In how users, what users kind of uh, buy and how we use this culture, right? So for example, uh, just to kind of give you one example, contemporary fashion designers around the world may be creating items that can have very diverse styles, silhouettes, forms, volumes, materials, textures, and colors, but the diversity of items being purchased and worn by people worldwide may be much smaller, right? So there may be like million, right? 10,000 different kind of fashion styles available in Moscow, but maybe people only can use, you know, 10%. Um, so I will just sit, literally take like two, one minute, two minutes, 90 seconds, just to show you very briefly some examples, very, very simple examples of kind of visualizing diversity in uh, visual data sets uh, from my lab. I mean, we have published also some like scientific papers and top scientific journals. So probably some of you have went to special mathematics school like me, right? Uh, not only to art school, so you can read one, right? Um, but here are some examples. So this is maybe, you know, this project we did about uh, comparing selfies, right? So we, we made a database of selfies, and you can select selfies, right, in uh, using different parameters. So here, for example, a graph. Uh, so what's been plotted are the head sizes in uh, hundreds of selfies in different cities. And I haven't really measured them, but I think it's kind of obvious, but in this case, I think Moscow probably has more diversity, right, because for other, for other cities, right? So there are very few photographs for like, like very big heads, but are very few photographs for very small heads. So mostly you have this Gaussian distribution, but Moscow, this is probably all the girls showing very beautiful figures, right? Sorry for this sexist comment, but that's probably like my research hypothesis, right? <laughs> so anyway, but it makes it more diverse, right? Uh, and then this is like the kind of work my students, you know, my students do, right? So this is a student started to collect paintings from a number of impressionist artists and then measured average saturation, average hue, and simply plotted these paintings. And it's interesting to see that with impressionist artists, you know, because we probably all lived in Paris, and then we all went to the same kind of, uh, you know, Baravija type place in the summer, right? We're all operating in the same color space, you know, but um, it's not over paintings. So you can also, from this, probably visually say, you know, that in fact, where color diversity, like the kind of colors in the paintings are similar, but uh, this is not the final one. And then this is the last example. Again, this is all like old work. This is from 2010. This is one million uh, pages from manga books we have analyzed and rendered using software I wrote. And they rendered uh, in such a way that as you move around the space, you kind of see different styles. So now I'll show you three close-ups going from up, down. So this is the top part, right? Very, you know, very textured, very dense, more labor. This is like a middle, a bit more graphic, and then that's the bottom part, right? Uh, you know, very, very kind of very graphic, not lots of textures, not lots of 3D, right? So when you look at this, I mean, you can measure it, but you don't need to know statistics because visually you can see that there are certain styles, right? There are certain kind of, which are much more present, and there are other styles which are not present. 
So if you think about manga, right, or other cultural forms almost as a kind of evolution of species, you can say why is particular species of manga developed, why our species didn't develop. Even, of course, you can compare, you can render with clouds for different genres, you know, different genders, different kind of market, manga market, and compare them, right? So in the case of visual culture, you don't even need to measure anything, you can simply visualize it. So thank you so much, I'm sorry, like I haven't read papers like this for like 12 years. I know it was a bit awkward, but I really try to be on time. Uh, and I hope you'll have energy for like one and a half question. Thank you so much. One and a half. Если у нас сил на полтора вопроса. I've got time enough for just one question and a half, maybe. Если у нас and if there are no questions, then a small migration inside the hall. Yes, please. Uh, could you explain a bit more in your presentation the AI does it really promote diversity or to your mind it uh, just uh, makes it more uniform and uh, levels it to a certain degree yes you know this is a problem uh, people expect me to give a direct answer and and I usually reply that I need to measure things and then provide the answers, and sometimes I uh, defy the expectations in not providing the answer. Purely intuitively, speculatively, I think that if we consider a specific part of the visual culture, let's say the Instagram posts or some other services, or, no, let's start all over. You know, I am for measuring, I'm all for measuring things. And I read once a paper uh, which correlated the effect of comments on YouTube and diversity, and recommendations. So, what people watch on YouTube without recommendations versus what they watch with recommendations. And the conclusion was that recommendations promote diversity. You watch more diverse videos with recommendations. It worked at that year and it worked on YouTube. And that's it. I cannot generalize it more. But it's really positive because it means that recommendation systems do show us things that we would not have looked upon without them. That's one positive result that I have. Otherwise, yes, we need to look into it further. And, you know, I skipped one point today that uh, the role of AI in culture is not very big. There are many more important factors. When the, a cos uh, shop opens in Moscow, then the diversity will grow. The presence of the internet, the presence of certain stores is important for creators. But yes, AI will play a bigger role in diversity in the future. Maybe we'll all need some degrees in computer science. I am not a specialist in computer science, but uh, I am now a professor of computer science. So so it course. becomes more important. Thank you. Yes, we're all for costs. Why do we need to pay more than 100 bucks for clothing? Only fools would do this. That's it? Yes, thank you very much. Oh yeah, half a question coming. And I'll give half an answer. Good evening. Uh, well, uh, I'll also be quite alarmist, but from another perspective. The Marxist critics were afraid of the global unification of culture due to its automatization, the culture industry. It was a metaphor for them, but still. Uh, and then this writer and futurist Ivan Yefremov in Soviet Union, he was afraid of this great catastrophe uh, in history uh, of a monoculture uh, due to technology. But now there is much more uh, dangerous thing of bubbling. 
micro-targeting uh, and customization leading us to existing in a bubble when everybody exists in their own cultural context and culture stops being common, everything is custom-made shows, music, uh, images, everything. So, what about the question then? Because they're going to shut us down. So, what's, uh, what's more dangerous? What do you think? Unification or bubbling? Uh, you know, I need some numbers to, to answer the question, I need figures. But you know, I travel a lot, I have this opportunity, and when I come to Moscow, I see everything is so diverse, people are dressed in a different manner, because, you know, I was born in the Soviet Union, and so coming back to Moscow after many years, uh, you will get an understanding that they will wear certain things and will not wear others, as opposed to New York. So maybe we overestimate people's independency. They want to conform, they don't want to be pointed at. So in any location there are social and cultural norms that people follow and people need to be very courageous to stop conforming because if you're not conforming you will not get a job you will be stoned uh, and so on so yes there are bubbles but on the other hand there are no bubbles people conform to the same norms even if they get everything customized but there are norms relevant to certain city culture and so on you know discussion is different uh, in moscow questions are different from scandinavia and in scandinavia they will be silent uh, and so on so i'm not afraid of bubbling and the last point here you may talk about AI, which promotes diversity, but look at contexts 50 or 500 years ago. Diversity is growing in any regard, if we take a long-term view. Maybe it has been growing until 2015 and now it's uh, reducing. Because, you know, Moscow looks more like uh, New York to me. It's a kind of a trend zoo uh, replicating the same trends. St. Petersburg is not like that. But it will be interesting to measure this all, to measure all these processes. Okay, I, I've uh, been carried away. But uh, you gave us this bon mot about uh, the trend zoo. Okay. And now I'd like to uh, pass the word to the next uh, participant uh, of the conference, Vlad Strukov. At last he is going to talk to us about things we have been doing and to help us consider things we did during the first part of the IAM project. He is going to talk to us about uh, how museums should look, how Exhibition uh, formats and institutional models are changing, what are uh, digital media, and so on. How they change uh, the relationship between the museum uh, and the viewer, uh, the changes in competences uh, of the viewers, uh, of the visitors. So I think that everybody who works directly in museums with exhibitions, they will be uh, amused and uh, they will have a lot of fun listening to this presentation and to reflect upon what we have done and what we can do to shake it up, to shake up the exhibition formats. Uh, and let me introduce you, uh, you're an associate pro professor in film and digital culture at the University of Leeds in Britain and he's been a visiting professor at many places all across Europe and author of many books. Um, hi everyone, it kind of feels a bit strange holding these two things. I feel like I'm a king or something. Um, it's fantastic to be in Moscow. Thank you, Garage, for organizing this amazing event. And I specifically want to thank the interpreters who are doing uh, this job today. Thank you, guys. You're, you're absolute stars. Um, what I want to do today is to, um, as um, um, Kadi just said, is to reflect a little bit on issues of the contemporary. Um, and this is something that I've been working on all my career. Um, and I want to do this in kind of three stages that I will introduce um, as we get by. So the first speaker, Anna, uh, presented a very specific view of the future 
and that is the future that is associated with change. In a way, to me, that sort of association is a kind of a fetish that we think about the future as something that will bring change. And actually, on a personal level, I subscribe to that kind of vision of the future, something that will bring change. But as a researcher, what I also kind of see as a possibility is that the future will hold no change, that it will be static, things will just reoccur constantly. Um, and this is actually what uh, Kati introduced in her opening remarks as a kind of a digital eternity or uh, eternal life that will come in that future. <coughs> Another thing that is very interesting to me uh, to think about is that what if in the future we know that there is change, but we are unable to apprehend it, we are unable to understand that we don't have the tools actually to understand what that change is about. In other words, what if that change is bigger than ourselves? And what if that future changes ourselves to an extent that we are no longer what we are now, but something else? And so what I want to do uh, is to talk about two kinds of modernities. Um, and you know, this is kind of one of my obsessions. Uh, one modernity that I want to present today is that of certainty. Um, if you want to have a kind of a metaphor from science, I'll probably call Newton's physics as a kind of a metaphor for that sort of modernity, where we want, we desire certainties of all kinds. And yet, there is another kind of future coming, and that is the future of uncertainties, where we are not sure how it will hold. And again, if I were to use a metaphor from science, I'd probably use quantum mechanics as a way to indicate that that future is multiple, where we are multiple, where now more than one, I'm more than just Vlad, I'm probably also an algorithm that Lev talked about. I'm also a number of tools of choices that were made for me, or maybe actually I exist in many spaces, such as London and Moscow at the same time. I don't mean that I'm actually physically divided, I'm kind of photocopied or anything, but rather in my mind, in my imagination, I constantly switch between those locations in the same way as those who speak more than one language already see the world from that multiple perspective. So what I want to do today is to talk about a local event here in Moscow that I'm sure you're familiar with, then I want to zoom out and talk about some global trends and then zoom in again, but in a different locations, talk about a project that, that I was involved in for some time. Um, so um, this is a kind of a introduction to that debate. Uh, it kind of, in a way, documents my global travel, so you can kind of see where I've been. But let me just emphasize that you don't actually have to go there to imagine what those places are like anymore, right? You, there are tools for us to see what the world actually is like. But to me, it's important to trace those movements to see that change, or rather the lack of change. And I really want, want to show today is a kind of a crisis of the museum of contemporary art as we know it now. So let me try to do it using all kinds of examples. So the Moscow event that I want to start with um, happened, I think, about a couple of weeks ago when some people went to the Chetikov Gallery, right? Um, and they went with an excursion that they self-organized. It was not authorized by the museum or anyone else. They just walked in and said, let's talk about art. And what happens is that they were not allowed to do that. They were actually taken away by the security um, and you know, I don't even know what happened to them afterwards, but I imagine they started posting about this on Facebook because eventually that event was picked up by global media such as the BBC, which reported about that event. So there are different ways of reading this. Of course, the BBC picked on this idea that the Kremlin wants to control everything, including uh, visitors to the museum, the Tretikov Gallery, so you're no longer allowed to go to the gallery and actually talk about art. That's the kind of a stance that the British media often takes when, report, when it reports about um, um, Moscow. Another reading is, of course, um, to think about it from the point of view of the museum and uh, its stakeholders are obviously worried about uh, kind of uh, getting money to support the museum, the staff, to make sure that they can you know, restore the paintings and make them available to the public. What I'm interested in is something else, and that is, to me, that event is about the crisis of that modernity of certainty. 
Let me remind you that in the old good days, a visitor to the museum was supposed to go there on their own, so one man and one woman, stand in front of a painting in a particular spot to observe it in a very specific way, something that we know as the linear perspective. Those days are gone, of course, um, and what this event really signifies is this conflict between the traditional setup of a museum that was established already in the 19th century and the contemporary practice of self-organization sharing, where actually I don't have to go to the Tretikov Gallery with my friends to talk about art. I can do so on Instagram, as some of you are doing this, chatting to your friends as you listen to me. So I go there as many, not one, right? Um, so this is something that actually, to me, is way more important and bigger than just the Kremlin trying to control visitors to an art gallery in Russia. What I want to do now is to kind of move away from Moscow and look at some global trends. And I'm going to push my chair, so, or maybe actually stand, so I can also see what's happening on screen there. So um, I'm going to start with Tate uh, in London to say that there is an interesting phenomenon occurring in Britain, and that is what I describe here as a return of the painting, right? There was a time, let's say 20 years ago, that you would go to Tate and you would see very strange things happening, as in performances, music art, um, you know, digital art, all kinds of interactions. Interestingly, in Tate Britain now, two floors are taken by two exhibitions that present only paintings, nothing else but paintings. They do so also chronologically. In other words, they cover a whole century, 20th century. Floor one does you know, the first 50 years, and floor two does the second 20 years. To me, like the event in Tretikovka, it's a kind of a return to that sense of certainty um, and an indication of a crisis of that experimentation with interactive uh, art, or what we know from theory as uh, relational aesthetics. Those who are, who've done their kind of art education would know what I'm talking about here immediately. Another example that I want to kind of draw on as a sign of that crisis of display uh, is an exhibition I had a chance to see in Bogota in Colombia, which combines elements of big data, something Clef talked about a few minutes ago, and also traditional painting. So you know that Colombia went through a very difficult process of uh, decriminalizing, sorry, actually kind of fighting the criminal uh, drug dealer, uh, d dealing uh, uh, in the country, which was a very traumatic experience. I don't have the time to go into that. But what this artist did is that he tried to map all the places in Colombia where all kinds of atrocities uh, occurred, uh, in other words, mass killings, right? And so as you go into the exhibition, you see this uh, Google positioning of crime in Colombia that is related to drugs. What this artist also did, and this is the kind of a return to the painting, is that he asked soldiers from Colombian army who actually took part in executions of people to draw their experiences. And this is a work of art that documents uh, one of the killings um, in a Colombian village. And clearly, this was used as a way to deal with trauma and kind of post-traumatic disorder of those soldiers. But it's also a document of uh, the national trauma um, and generally a document of modernity that is about to disappear. Now, this takes me to another global trend and that of a uh, combination of data and documentation as to really big problems that uh, museums of art have to deal with uh, in the contemporary world. So I've got this example, which I like very much. Um, it was shown um, at an exhibition in London that I think you also presented some work at Liff. That was a couple of years ago. Anyway, so it's um, an artist that uses pixelation and color coding to represent war victims uh, of the US and airline invasion of Iraq and the Iraq war. And so there are two images. The first one um, uses four colors to represent different kinds of victims. So those who were civilians, those who were um, American soldiers, those who came from other countries. And so these four bands of color uh, represent the scale of uh, those deaths. 
Uh, the orange color in the middle is the Iraqi uh, sold, uh, sorry, Iraqi civilians that died in the conflict. And that really shows the scale of war. The critique of this work in that it examines the kind of the typical standard way of using data to represent some social phenomena. And that is the image on the right where pixels are mixed, where the colors are mixed, and actually we don't get to see how many soldiers, how many people on which side died in that particular conflict. So on the one hand, it's a project that involves big data and analysis and formulas and what's left described as measurements of all kinds, tools to identify an experience for everyone. On the other hand, it criticizes that very process through documenting trauma um, and war. Another example that I wish to use in this category uh, is something that I picked on very recently at Berlin Biennale. Uh, it's a different kind of work of art where as you enter the exhibition you get to see a number of works displayed as a painting. And I want to use this as a visual metaphor to go back to my original idea to say that one is no longer one but one as many, right? It kind of exists in multiplicity uh, as an extended self. And then as you look at each of the works, you see how the artist uses maps, very old maps, not digital maps, but kind of like those who were printed on paper, and superimposes imagery on them. And to me, those layers represent different stages of modernity, that of certainty and another one of uncertainty. I'm moving on to my third point that uh, shows a kind of a crisis of the museum and new questions that arise with the shift towards uncertainty. And then I'll talk about the project that I was involved in. Um, so that piece in a glass box actually is not rock. Uh, it's not some kind of a nature made, well actually it's a nature made thing. Anyways, it's a piece of a bigger thing, which is known as Fadberg. Congratulations, interpreters, you're going to have to deal with this. So a Fadberg is an English word that brings together two words, fat and iceberg. It's the largest object consisting of human waste that was found in London sewage that was bigger than a double-decker, you know, that sort of big um, London bus. And so the Museum of London took a piece of that and brought it into the museum and they're trying to preserve it now, basically a piece of shit, if I may, as a document of human activity at the start of the 21st century. Because it clearly contains DNA of Londoners, it shows what we eat, what we consume, what kind of medication we use, right? Uh, and all other kind of exciting things that humans do. So in a way, to me, that is a material metaphor of that sort of big data that we live in, right? Uh, it's, it's a cluster of things that are impossible to measure in a way, right? It's that uns certain uncertainty, uh, if you wish. Another kind of dilemma of curators, I think, at the moment is how to document context, right? As you guys go from one museum to another, from, from one lecture series to another in Moscow and in other places around the planet, you will see that lots of things kind of pop up here and there, that there is a certain cycle, that artists travel, that there are fashions and trends, etc. And eventually you start kind of wondering, but when did I see that last time, right? Sort of, you, you, you begin to forget. There is a sense of that, oh yeah, I know that, but I don't remember where and why and with whom I actually saw that project. In other words, you no longer know your context. And to me, art does not exist without context because it makes meaning only through context. And so there's fantastic work by a Turkish artist who documents uh, gender and body in a Turkish context. And so this work has been shown around the world, uh, which basically is a reference to a practice of men going to a hammam in Turkey and enjoying a good bath. But because this is Turkey, you really cannot kind of show the body in great detail. And so uh, sort of legs and feet are used as a reference to that. 
Also, and I'm moving on kind of an art historical context here, is that it's more of a reference to the times when you could not represent a human body uh, in Islam. So it's an interesting work of art where context has been completely lost. It's just for many people a reference to going to a bath, right, going to a hammam. So uh, this takes me to the last part of my presentation, um, and here I will probably chime in with what Katya was saying in the introduction, and that is how we kind of go beyond the museum and how we go beyond who we are and try to reinvent um, our, ourselves and, and places. So I want to talk about this artist that I know personally, Dave Lynch. He's not related to the filmmaker. He's just a lad from Yorkshire. This is the city of Leeds where I work, and so he's based there. And this is how we kind of came to know each other, through a local connection. Um, he's known as somebody who makes laser projections uh, in the cities. So what he does in this particular case is that he takes a laser, puts it on a horse, I'm not joking, and gallops around the city of Leeds so that the laser projects a galloping horse on the city environment, this way creating a kind of a palimpsest or an augmented reality. To be sure, this is another one, and you can see kind of Yorkshire skyline out there, very dark clouds. Um, we instantly recognize a reference to Moybridge's uh, experimentation with uh, still photography that eventually became what we know now as film, where again a galloping horse was used as a way to prove that there is time in the work of art and that if we collect those things together, eventually we will create a new form of art such as film. So this is another example where that galloping horse appears next to, I think, an advertising billboard there on the left. So there are multiple references here. And to me, they really represent the end of that modernity of certainty, the galloping horse, and the unknown, uncertain future. So um, this guy created a particular tool, a mechanism that he calls zoopraxiscope. Uh, which enables him to project very detailed images uh, in environments that are unstable. So imagine, as you are galloping on a horse, the machine that you are carrying shakes, right? So supposedly the image should be very unstable, but actually he has a mechanism that allows this image to be very stable. And so th what he wanted to do in this project called Nimbus that I was involved in is to project on clouds. Right? So he hired a plane, this kind of, again, old-fashioned plane that represents modernity, stands for modernity of certainty, took the machine and went with that machine into the sky above Yorkshire. And he started projecting the galloping horse on clouds. Now, there is a brilliant movie made in Russia under the electrical skies where similar um, thing was used as well. So why is this important? Uh, as we know, clouds are a kind of a symbol of thermodynamics, right? This is the kind of a leap towards quantum mechanics. It's the very last stage of the modernity of certainty. Obviously, the galloping horse connects us to the end of the 19th century, to the start of a kind of a mechanical or even digital modernity, if you wish, in its prototype. But most importantly, it is all about the role of the viewer. Who gets to see that kind of stuff, right? Who knows that there will be a galloping horse on a cloud somewhere in Yorkshire? Well, that someone is actually global media because that was picked up by new scientists and went on a circle as a fantastic experiment. Uh, there's me there talking to Dave. Uh, that is to say that this project evolved uh, as a collaborative work of art between an artist, between academics such as myself, between mechanics, pilots, the public, the media, and the global vision. Because arguably those photographs of a galloping horse, or rather the horse itself, could have been seen from space. We don't know, right? Because the clouds move anywhere. And so where I'm going to go with this um, is a term used in quantum mechanics known as superposition. 
And that is when a thing, an object, can actually exist in multiple forms. It's sort of like if you speak simultaneously a hundred languages, or you get to see a hundred screens at the same time. And at the, on one level, it is something that we can comprehend. On another, it is something that remains very uncertain. Something that suggests that in the future, the museums as we know now will become really museums of museums, of the previous version of modernity. And what we are to see is the emergence of those practices of superposition, which will be on one level uh, very exciting, but on another so unpredictable, so unstable, so unknown, that we may not have the tools to understand and map and kind of archive them in the way that we do it now. Thank you very much. I can take questions in Russian, by the way. <laughs> Если вопросы, пожалуйста. So are there any questions, please? Take a microphone. Thank you. Now, in the context of uh, this connection to the 19th century, it would be logical to see a film adaptation of uh, The Bronze Horseman by Alexander Pushkin uh, with a statue uh, of a horseman being alive and uh, galloping through the city and this being superimposed. Yes, it's a great idea. Other questions? Just a moment, please take the microphone for the translation. So, in light of what you told us about the future of the museum, what do you think about the future of the V&A London, in London? You know, I have a project where I interviewed museum directors across Europe, including Victoria Nelbert, Copenhagen, and so on and so forth. And they all say the same thing. They are preparing not to the future at the museums, but to conserving them, like, you know, creating preserves of uh, fruit and vegetables and making them a monument to the past. And this shook me, really, because I was expecting these people to want to uh, make the museums live into the future. But they don't see this, really, because they don't want to invest into conservation of digital objects. They believe that a museum, or rather, other museums should uh, curate digital art and work with digital art and that's completely other thing that's their point and you know yes v and a have some digital stuff but uh, even these practices are very traditional they very often print out digital photos or use them as objects as physical objects and so on so in fact these leaders of the museum field, they were speaking about the need to conserve the existing museums and to stop at the present moment. Yes, that's about Europe. Please, more questions? Good afternoon, I've got a very general question, maybe relevant to all the speakers here. What do you think? These artists that uh, fix a moment in time, aren't they the generators of uh, those conserving impulses? Don't they contribute to conserving because they want to catch this moment in time in their artwork? And it's this endless uh, uh, picture with uh, a lot of manga uh, pages. Maybe this is about this new art. It doesn't have a living viewer, it's all about the digital. That's an interesting thought. Uh, let, me, uh, let me try and expand upon it, not just answer. Uh, this always amazes me, this lack of big difference between museum practices across the world. They're all alike in their nature. Maybe the European ones are slightly different from others, but still. Like, there was a time when the main issue of the museums was the issue of access. 
I'm not sure how to say this in Russian really, but it's about providing access, accessibility to all kinds of people, whatever they are. And I think this age is uh, behind us already. Everybody has access now, and now the paintings are coming back and so on. You know, artists are ironic. They criticize the museum, but they also work for its future. And so I think that the works that I showed, they present us this opportunity to look at the future in a different context, to build different relationships between the so-called visitor and the so-called object. And, you know, to consider what an object is. This is a question that does not mean that the object necessarily becomes digital. It may become something different, unseen before. And I think another question here. <coughs> you know, uh, I have a question uh, that derives from your recent answer. Uh, when we speak about media art, how can we preserve it? How can we conserve it? Because you have told us about the context. Uh, when you told us about the galloping horse, it's a project that, li that lives in the moment. We cannot conserve it. It means that the media art is lost after this moment. Of course, this is a question that doesn't have a definite answer, it was asked in the 60s already, but still, do you have a vision of how we can conserve media art or we should uh, not attempt it? But maybe conservation is already part of the project. We don't need any additional institution, any additional individual who would perform this function. What if this is the product? I mean, my question is about uh, transferring this knowledge to further generations. Will we just print out the photos or uh, show the videos? Do invite me to your institution, I'll tell you. But you know, Vlad, thanks to your answers, we have a natural segue to the next topic of the next presenter, to an individual who probably knows everything about this. And uh, he is one of the most authoritative in people in this field. He is a platform by himself, an organization by himself, popularizing and telling about digital media and digital art and uh, online art, how to preserve it and what strategies, strategies we can use and uh, how this all uh, changes the life of museums. So, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, and now I'd like to pass the floor uh, with a great pleasure and some awe to Dragon Espenshid. And his topic is preserving performative media. He's going to talk about digital and net art, uh, very vulnerable form of art, even if it's omnipresent. And so it's very vulnerable and fragile. And Dragan, as an artist, one of the founders of uh, an organization called Rizom, founded already in 1996, as early as this, with additional with assistance of the new museum at new in New York, and one of their main projects was just about preservation of uh, digital media and digital art. And I think I have said everything, and now I hope that this presentation will help us all uh, together to learn more and to find answers to questions that plague us all and interest us all. Please, Dragon. Thank you, Katya. Um, when I was listening to this on the headphone, I thought, is she really talking about me? That was a very <laughs> flattering introduction. Thank you so much. Um, um, okay, oh yeah, so this, it's already visible on screen. So um, I, want to, um, I want to speak about Rhizome's preservation program that I'm the director of. And um, this is our very fancy logo, and you see it's already not static, and I was putting a lot of strain on the technical team here because I wanted to present everything from the live internet and everything has to be like in a running state. So I thank you very much for um, agreeing to all my caprices <laughs> and giving me this wonderful laptop here. Mm -hmm. um, so um, r just a quick, a quick background. Rhizome was uh, founded in 1996 by the media artist um, Mark Tribe in New York and on the internet. And um, 
we have launched, I mean, I wasn't a part of Rhizome back then, but in 1999, the, the art base was launched as kind of a institutional provocation so that anyone, any artist or who would see themselves as an artist could upload their artwork to the art base and be then part of this uh, like f future looking archive of an art form that tried to establish itself at that point in time. Um, and it has grown to like 2000 pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and since 2003, we are an affiliate of the New Museum in New York. Um, however, we don't have an exhibition space and we also don't have a hardware lab. When I started to work for Rhizome in 2014, I made a point in announcing on Twitter that we are giving away old hardware for anyone who wants to have it. Um, and so we focus totally on the internet and totally on software and totally on yeah, what, what happens in that space. And our latest program is um, the NetArt Anthology, which is a, uh, which I can um, recommend you to look at, which is um, guided by the, um, uh, by the artistic program and presents 100 works of NetArt in a two-year time span, like every week, a new piece, which some of them are pretty old and this keeps um, my colleagues and me in the preservation field relatively busy. Um, and what we do in general is like, I, I will not cover all of this because of the limited time, is we are doing research and production in emulation and web archiving and linked data for preservation purposes. And um, what we do as a cultural institution is we, we create software tools and we take part in creating software tools for preservation. Um, th the challenges for for net art is, I mean, this is something that I always have to show when there's a, when there's some, um, when, when net art is discussed or when rhizome is in general discussed. This is the simple net art diagram by the artist group MTAA. Um, and yeah, I'm very interested here in these great ads that are visible in Russia. Um, so, so the idea is to, um, to explain what, what net art is, um, that it's not, that is, there, there is no screen essentialism, or there's, you, you wouldn't, if you, if you take a picture of it, that would not be the net art. Um, and there are many, um, many versions of that, of that diagram. This is from Kevin Burstor from 2008, from his project uh, Maximum Sorrow, which like tries to put the point where the art happens into the, into the um, actual users on the end of the net. But I think the one that um, catches it best is from uh, an artist called Abe Lincoln, which is the com complex net art diagram from 2003, which looks like that and um, <laughs> pretty much illustrates the challenges that I'm facing in my job. Um, so uh, this is, uh, this is an, an art form that has been described as very fragile because it is built on the top of very complex technical ensembles and also cultures or, or trends or movements that appear and disappear pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, it's, it's still loading, so in the interest of time, you should all look at it. Um, and how preservation is um, typically approached is on a level of data. So that means that um, you're trying to preserve the data, and this is also a classic business kind of thing. Your data is forever, your software lasts some time, and the hardware, you just buy a new one every year. You buy the fastest computer. Only if you're, a, I don't know, a national railway organization, you stick with your mainframe that you bought in the 70s or so, but, mm -hmm. or, or a bank. But usually, um, in an ideal world, you would keep your data, but um, art, uh, the digital art that we are speaking about is very specific to the, the medium it works with, which is uh, computers and networks. And I want to give a little example here about, um, about what it can mean for data to actually uh, be separated from performance. Um, this, is a, this is a way how we, how we present legacy um, artworks in the, in the NetArt Anthology. I hope it will function right now. Yeah, because you need quite a, a bit of internet space here. So this is a, this is a work from 1996 that appeared as, uh, uh, by the group IOD uh, from Great Britain. 
and it was a magazine like our zine that was passed around on diskettes. Um, they also made, uh, which is also which you can think as a predecessor of, of network, just like mail art or phone art or fax art or whatever other practices. And um, you would use, uh, you would insert the disk, and it would install a software. And this install process actually is is part of the artwork too. So the the license that you are agreeing to is um, pretty outrageous, and it will unpack your it will unpack the files. The files are now here, but they are very specific to that um, to that operating system that was popular at that point in time, Macintosh OS 7, because it puts the it puts the every folder that you open in its own uh, window in a in a discrete um, visual arrangement, and um, by the, in that way creates a creates a poem that um, that is if if you just think about this as data as files you will immediately lose that performative aspect of it. Um, I will try to go to the part where you can choose your own adventure, kind of. There is a way where the poem uh, divides in two strains. Oh yeah, so now it's a new, like, a new thing is happening. And yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really beautiful. And um, yeah, so, 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 but you already see the thing that the artist did is is minimal if you if you just if you just I mean on the te on the level of technical complexity, it is um, it is a very small intervention in in the file system and it's uh, all the kind of all the technical work has been done by software engineers and hardware engineers and yeah uh, at Apple and um, that's uh, that doesn't make the artwork less. Valuable. Uh, the opposite, actually, it is. It is very elegant, but it's also. Um, it also conflicts with how a museum would usually approach an artwork, because an artwork for a museum is something that the artist one day woke up and they created it from nothing, um, and then that that usual. Let's say it's a painting. In most cases, it's one, um, and that has to be analyzed like down to the to the chemical composition and that chemical composition has to be kept intact and if you're trying to do that with a computer from 20 years ago you are lost i mean that's also why i mean there are institutions that are able to to keep old computers running um, these are usually very old computers who run at low speed because the computers that we use today they're basically frying themselves to death each time we are turning them on they have such a there is such an, an heat inside of them and they are so small the the how it's called the stuff where the electrons run through i forgot the english word now um, that that they are destroying themselves basically while running and it will be pretty impossible in 10 years to create a computer processor as it is created today or as an as intel because they will tear down that factory that Produces the i7 and build a new one that uh, that builds the the i8 processor or whatever. Okay, um, so but to handle this, so we have a collection of of <laughs> two thousand uh, pieces, and most traditional museums uh, have collections of that type of art form if they have anything at all. It's like a dozen. There are some. Uh, outstanding institutions like um, yeah, IMAL in Brussels or Haus Elektronische Künste in Basel, Switzerland. But um, in general, what we are trying to do as we want to help this art to gain a foothold in the, in the art world is to provide the right level of abstraction that an institution can actually handle the preservation of such an artwork. And so if you look at it from the complexity point, when we look at that at that little archive of files that, that came out. So you have the artifact that is like a very small grain of salt on top of a pyramid. Um, there is a software environment that has been created by, uh, I mean, nowadays it's hundreds of people that, for example, create an operating system or create an application like Unity that artists like very much or things like that. And then there's also hardware that is controlled by the software. And I mean, each of these layers is um, is impossible to understand by a single person and is only possible to understand by an organization the size that actually creates these types of things, which is Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, or something like that. So the art world cannot compete with that. So what we try to do is, um, and this is in, in, a, in a 
research partnership, um, especially with the University of Freiburg um, in Germany. There is a limited amount of hardware that exists uh, each year, let's say, that's countable. Um, on each hardware, you may be able to run a number of operating systems and software as it gets updated before the hardware is discarded. And then you have the uncountable amount of artifacts that you actually care about as an art preservation person or as a, in general, yeah. Oh, Red Bull. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, um, and with, with, that, with that level, you also keep the right things disconnected from each other. Because if you think about the artwork as a, as a, as a, as a whole, like that computer that the artist used to create that website and that computer has to be preserved, that is nonsense in a way because the artist had no say in how that computer was made or had no influence. They probably just got the cheapest one uh, at, at that moment. So it's not part of the thing, but you would need an array of, of environments in which you could re-perform that artwork. And so that's what, I'm, what I skipped before because it fits better here. I should actually move it here to that point um, here. Um, which is that um, an, a collection of this type of art is less of an art collection, but it's more of a repertoire of, a, of like a set of festivities or songs or something like that that is constantly re-performed and you keep, you tr you're trying to keep the knowledge around on how to do that. Um, which, also, which also includes um, that these things need to change over time. And I want to illustrate this with this um, work, um, My Boyfriend Came Back From The War, which had its 20-year uh, anniversary exhibition at the HIK, uh, Haus Elektronische Künste in Basel, in 2016, where we were um, helping to develop a museum setting that is using emulation and, and web archiving to represent that artwork. I will only uh, talk about, like, the original one from 1996, the, the whole exhibition was about these different, um, these different um, versions about it that were created also later. For example, there was a, other artists created versions on Twitter and things like that. Yeah, so um, there's a setting here where you can see there are some legacy computers on, on these tables. And they, um, there is this CRT screen there is this wonderful um, tower that has this uh, timeless, fashionable beige gray color. <laughs> and uh, there is that mouse. You see the resolution is pretty low. It's 800 to 600 pixels. This mouse has a ball, so if you move the mouse cursor, it's kind of like wobbling. And um, yeah. But what is it? This computer that we've just seen is just a theater prop this computer is not actually computing anything. Um, what is actually computing is this small um, computer that is now like a, a cheap office machine that runs an emulator with that old operating system and a web archive. And connected to that system is a mouse. There's, you see there is, there is a, an array of adapters so that this old mouse can be connected to that new computer. And there is an adapter to connect that old screen. So, while, um, uh, and this is also, this is just a way to show it in the museum because that work, of course, never had a canonical form to start with. It was looked at by, by all kinds of people and all kinds of computers and screens. And um, what we wanted to do to make it attractive in the museum is to show a scenario how it was contemporaneous to that time. So we also slowed down network speed mm to dial up modem f uh, four kilobytes per second so that the images would load really slowly. Um, visitors in the gallery were also able to, I don't know, fool around with Windows 95 and um, draw something in Microsoft Paint to get that context of the time that work was created in. So how did computers look? How did they work? How was that operating system behaving at that point in time? It, it canalizes lots of culture. I mean, operating systems are amazing. Uh, collections of, of contemporary culture. They don't, they're not only created, but they also embody it in, in many ways. And here, this is this, the show Travel to Eindhoven, again on this emulated setup. And here, um, the same style was used, but uh, there was a glass table 
so that you could even see that it's a uh, that the actual computer is somewhere else. Um, so these screens and mice and all of these kinds of things, they will at some point go, maybe just like um, museums were banding together to recreate neon tubes from the 1920s to recreate light sculptures from that point in time. Maybe at some point they will also feel the need to have a bunch of CRT monitors built or something like that. But yeah, that's, um, that might be or might not be the case. We have, we have the software. So, um, the most important thing when you're thinking about preserving something uh, is an object boundary. It is also a per there's also a performative boundary and there's the performance of archiving or the performance of preserving something as well. Um, a classic artwork, let's go to the painting again because I really, I can't see paintings anymore. <laughs> um, there is a painting is a self-contained thing and if you if you throw light at the painting the light comes back into your eyes it kind of works all by itself you don't need to do much by it you just need to keep it in its original shape and as long as the sun shines and as long humans have eyes you will be able to perceive it um, it's a very bound object it's it's um, Kind of, you don't need any additional knowledge to see something. You just need your eyes. And maybe you want to move around with your, with your body to, to look at it from different angles. Um, in, the, in the world of software, we might say like a CD-ROM or something like that is very bound. Like something before the internet became, came along because you put it in the computer and everything that, C that artwork needs is on the CD-ROM. Um, then there are blurry objects. Blurry objects are maybe something that an artist has created, but it makes references to other things that the artist has no control over. And that is, that is a typical net art situation. Um, the simplest thing is an artist, I don't know, writes a, writes a blog on their own server, they control the server and could actually take the software on that server and hand it over to Rhizome or another institution. And that would be a manifestation of that work. But as, as soon as there's a single YouTube video in that blog, let's say, that doesn't work anymore, so the object becomes blurry. The, the borders are not really clear anymore. And the, the boundless object means that the object is totally located on infrastructure and machinery that the artist has no control over, like, let's say, Instagram. We can't go, an artist can't go to Facebook and say, can you give me Instagram? So my artwork can be preserved. Even, even if Facebook would agree to do that, there is no way this can actually happen because Instagram is, has no stable state. <clears throat> so um, as we are moving uh, around these object boundaries, we are also sliding, uh, we, we have like a sliding, let's say preservation quality or so. You have the full performative preservation and you have um, something that goes more in the direction of documentation. But with, um, with these types of artworks that we are dealing with, there is this, um, there is there's like a gradient. And we are always trying to, to do the best we can so that it's preserved in a way that makes the most sense. But there's, yeah, these, these are the elements we're working with. So um, I want to quickly show this, um, this artwork uh, from Amalia Ullmann, which was an Instagram performance. And it, I think it really illustrates um, this was created with the tool that we are also creating, which is called Web Recorder. Um, so you see, this is how Instagram used to look in 2014. And um, our tool Web Recorder is able to capture it in exactly that state and make it accessible again. The emojis from that time are also there. And, um, and this, is a, this is something that looks like a fully functioning Instagram version, which was yeah, captured from, from the web by this tool. <coughs> Um, however, there are some boundaries here that are artificially introduced in order to make it an object, which means like I can't follow to the profiles to these other users that made the comments, and the comments are a big part of that artwork in general. It has, it has been shown as, as photography um, or in photographic exhibition with just a, uh, square frames, which drives me up the wall, but 
well, that's what museums do, right? <laughs> and uh, and also, um, it's the um, it's uh, it is uh, of course this is just a part of the artist's Instagram stream. There was something before, there was something after, but we also cut that off in order to make it an artifact. Um, that is, of course, this is. To actually, to actually full, 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 performatively preserve it, that would mean um, to, I don't know, to have the artist recreate that, uh, that performance, which probably wouldn't work. Okay, and I, um, so now I want to quickly give an idea about um, what a perceived reality for a blurry object is and that is network traffic. So this is when, when, for example, I'm dealing with an Instagram artwork. I'll quickly go here to, to Web Recorder. Come on. And I will look at this Instagram stream of, an, of this German artist, Andy Cassier, who is, a, who is like also performing a certain persona on Instagram, like some dude that probably got rich with Bitcoin, or it's, it's not really clear. <laughs> Um, it's a, it's like a certain type of, um, just like uh, it is. It is often compared to Amalia Ullmann's performance, where she's going through like female stereotypes of, of uh, rich, cute um, uh, female Instagram users, and he's he's doing something like that on the on the male spectrum, maybe. Um, so, I would I would go here to. Oh, I need to log in, right? No, I don't need to. I will just do it anonymously for a second. So I will, um, I will log in here, um, paste, paste the URL and start the session. And that, um, we can actually do very similar things with emulation, I just can't show it to you right now because this is not my computer. But um, I am now looking at the Instagram profile through this tool and while I'm, while I'm triggering certain activities on the network here. This network activity is preserved here, and you see this counter is going up. Mm -hmm. It's recording the, the network traffic. And I can now um, perform certain things. I would, for example, click on this image because I think this is part of the performance. So now I have it. And if I stop capturing now, oh yeah, I know the new features. I know them, so. Um, <laughs> I can now go back at that, at that preserved version. Does it? Oh yeah, yeah, it just takes a bit longer here. The server is located in the United States. So, so now I can't click on any of the pictures I didn't click on before. That's the part of the boundary definition that I made. Um, but I can click on that exact picture that I, that I checked before and it will appear. However, if I choose another one now, it's like, well, the, it's not there. Yeah, so so that is that is a, a performative way of creating an object boundary and an, an archived version of that piece that is actually boundless. <clears throat> okay, um, I I try to keep this uh, I try to keep this simple. I hope you you got an idea of how this um, how this works, and I'm I'm happy to to answer any questions that you might have. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So now I can use this. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I should I should show the Rhizome logo in the meantime. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, um, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. Just a quick question: How do you choose a date? How do you choose a date you document something at? <coughs> Oh, this is um, this is depending. I don't need that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this is really dependent on the on the piece. Um, with the Amalia Ullmann piece, kind of, we were technically not ready with the tool while the performance was going on. I would have preferred to do that, kind of create an Instagram account and follow the artist because that is how would I would actually get to know about this performance or how, how I would see it from my perspective. Um, we were finished with the tool right after the performance, so we captured it in its final state. Um, there, is, there are certain pieces that 
um, are living uh, or where the main thing is that there is constant change. And so in that case, we would capture several versions of it. Um, the, the same is, with, for example, with these emulators. If you, if you have a website, you might, you want to keep the website also separated from the actual operating system and um, environment that you run it in because you might, uh, you might want to run it in different environments. So there's also a temporal, a temporal aspect to it. So uh, that also shows that this archive can never be really complete because you can't even define what, what that means. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Если еще вопрос у нас. Еще один вопрос. Well, um, I guess it's a kind of a philosophical question uh, about uh, the, um, uh, the distinction between uh, documenting uh, uh, and preserving, uh, for example, a lot of the uh, web art or digital art. Um, a lot of the digital art is uh, created um, uh, exactly to show this, um, uh, you know, fr fr fragility, fragileness, fr fragility, yeah, fragility yeah. Uh, of uh, d digital objects. Uh, for example, the. Uh, uh, GIF art, GIF art of uh, Olga Lelina, where uh, each frame is uh, saved on a different server, uh, and uh, to uh, f uh, for the uh, GIF to be complete, every uh, server should be online. Uh, so uh, it's uh, almost um, uh, like with the performance art. Uh, uh, when you're document, uh, documenting the performance of the artists, uh, um, what is the art itself, the performance or the documentation of it? Uh, oh, like this. wow, so that, that, is, that is great because that piece doesn't work right now yeah. or the site cannot be reached right now because one of the, the, one of the 20 people that each one hosts one animation of the, of the uh, one frame of the animation, um, apparently made a mistake and um, so now it's uh, so now that means th the performance is here now that the artist has to really get in contact with Jonas Lund super quickly and ask him can you get your server back up you lazy boy <laughs> um, but uh, that is um, th that of course I could web archive that and that would be a documentation of that point in time hopefully when it worked um, however, when, um, when that piece, for example, enters a, a collection that, uh, where certain effort of the upkeep can be uh, assumed, it could also mean that the owner of the, of the collection picks 20 of their friends and they, have to, and they have to stay in contact with them all the time. And so that, that could also be transferred and that could be preserved. That is just not a, a technical... Um, that's not a technical measure to take. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I like this point about fragility. There have been many, many words have been used about uh, volatile or fragile or ephemeral. This is the one I really don't like. Um, because it seems, uh, it seems like that there is a force of nature at work that destroys digital data, um, which in fact is not the case because if you would uh, if you would take care about the art, it wouldn't disappear. And, <laughs> and uh, in, in, in many cases, that would be possible. Oh, sorry. I, I think it's more like a comment, a friendly uh, kind of like footnote to your talk. <laughs> so I think it's all, as you said, it's all like relative, right? And, you know, it's very easy for us to say like a painting, a sculpture is kind of permanent, and that art is not. But um, the reality, you know, if you look at like paintings and our kind of works, especially ones from Renaissance and Middle Ages, we don't know. We, we actually we don't really exist in any any, any like determined state. 
you know, we have been restored many, many times. Sometimes restorers like put a kind of filter, so in order for these works to be popular, we make them kind of shiny. And um, so in a way, like all art is unstable. Uh, it's just a matter of time. It's just from like net art, it's just a bit, with, like, with software art or network art, it's just a bit faster, right? Uh, and just one more example. So, you know, Van Gogh, right? So he was like first, art, right, first generation of artists who used new medium of oil paint. And he used like this very kind of violent like, greens. People said, why your greens are so violent? He said, because I'm using this new medium of two paint. And from what I can see, in a few years, it'll become like much less green, much less saturated. So it's very hard to say like what is what is how his painting should look like. What's really painting, right? So it's really like just a bit of time. It's really just relative, right? So everything you have in garage is also unstable. You know, just wait, you just wait. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you, just, you, you just wait. Yeah, just, yeah just there, there is, wait. this is uh, this is this is um, something. So it's good, maybe it's yeah. good news, bad news. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it's just reality. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah but this, this yeah. is uh, this usually comes up um, when uh, th this is an, this is an interesting point because uh, at some. At some point in time, when we are discussing new media art or digital art, software art, um, conservators that buy into this thing, we say, oh yeah, it ha has always been like that, when for many years they just have been saying the opposite, or museums have operated in an opposite manner without realizing exactly what you said. And um, there is also, uh, I, again, I want to point out the parallels to, to certain practices or, ri or ritualization of, um, of art, for example, when you see how religious art is usually restored. Um, yes. yes. Yeah. Exactly. Made it like made like a very like shiny. Yeah. So so that means like <laughs> that art is made to be for yeah. a certain purpose. It's not That's be right. made to be fixed in time, but it's made to be um, to be a, a site of of religious practice, for example. Uh, so I just want uh, to let the dragon use uh, this um, shower, the headpiece uh, um, that we use here. So I think uh, it was very good uh, to talk about the strategies of uh, conservation and preservation because uh, um, uh, we realize how tender it is uh, and uh, how poetic it is uh, and uh, conservation and protection can uh, um, become a purely artistic practice. Also, Dragon mentioned uh, uh, something um, which uh, occurs regularly uh, uh, and uh, he touched upon the issues uh, of immortality and uh, mortal life and how we can extend life cycle of artworks and what can we do for that and quite naturally we are moving on to our next uh, speaker and our next uh, uh, presentation by Oksana Moroz, do you agree to digital immortality? So let's uh, um, think about the concept of death, mortality in this context, what it would lead to and uh, um, whether it is going to have an end. So Oksana Moroz is a doctor of cultural studies, uh, um, an associate professor of the, Depart the Department of Cultural Studies and Social Communication at uh, um, NIT. Dio Misa. Uh, she's also working in the Faculty of Social and Cultural Project Management at Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences, etc. So, unlike all the previous speakers, I'm going to be less oriented towards art and art practices. I'm much more interested in this fundamental issue, this controversy, uh, which was uh, described by Simon Don, who contrasted technicism and humanism, and this interaction between human and technology. And so I think that all the presenters today have touched upon this subject in this or that way, because at the end of the day it's hard to describe what people create or try to conserve while avoiding categories like life and death. It's hard to find some definitions or terms or set concepts 
if we cannot agree upon what we mean by life or death in the digital environment. And the question which I ask here in this provocative manner, do you agree uh, to digital immortality, is a distillation of what is often discussed in uh, communication theory, uh, talking about communication practices in digital or other communities, and that's what I have been studying recently. Now, if we look at the demographic, anthropological and cultural context of the digital, we will see that the most popular communication services have become the biggest cemeteries. Facebook is a good example, or VK in Russia, more familiar to most Russians. Uh, to a large degree, in certain segments at least, they become spaces where the living exist as well as the dead. And lately this phenomenon has been seen not by not only by individuals but also by the creators of the services. Certain business solutions arose that allow them, the companies, to uh, save resources on maintaining these dead profiles. For example, if you have not been visiting Twitter and not tweeting anything during 60 months, your account is deemed inactive and so this digital big brother proclaims you non-existent. And then the question arises, how will you fight for your right to be living? Maybe you are alive, but you have forgotten this account or you have uh, refrained from this communication uh, by your own wish. And so, looking at this change in the digital being and at uh, the uh, bearer of this living identity online, makes us think about this question, who determines this online existence? Is this the human being who has this naive experience of living and has a tradition of culturally articulating this? Or is this the mechanical means, the electronic means of uh, determining the l life uh, and the death? And so uh, the question of whether an individual wants digital immortality becomes a question of their attitude towards life and digital life. Because in fact we can discuss this thousand times, like a human is actively communicating during their whole life, working with this cultural software, uh, leaving tracks, but the point is not uh, whether we are able to articulate this, but whether we are able to consider this in practice. Uh, realize that every hour online gesture, every hour click is a performance of our activity, not in the art sense of the, world, of the word, but rather in the linguistic sense of it. It's a performative gesture. We are doing something, we are active. And so the other question here is whether we consciously leave this uh, digital trace. And that's why I am uh, presenting you the word life logging here, because when we talk about this digital trace, uh, we think about the components of this trace. How deeply we are engaged into this self uh, observation and reflection upon any action. Human reflection or machine reflection. For example, if you have a fitness tracker on your hand, uh, this fitness tracker is united into an infrastructure or ecosystem with your mobile phone, with your sporting apps, with your smart scales, and other ways of caring about your own body. It means that you are leaving this digital trace of data and that you proclaim your digital presence through digitalizing bodily practices. You are telling the story about yourself, consciously or unconsciously, although this is not directly communication. This is about your physical parameters. On the other hand, we can say 
that this digital trace is quite conscious. Or we believe it's conscious. You are posting things online. You are mixing content. You are sharing it. You are defining yourself through existence inside a community. It's a social activity, social experience, not bodily experience. Thirdly, we have an idea of uh, online economy. These measurable traces and moments that relate to how often we spend certain resources. Let's say the services we trust and services we don't trust. For example, do we trust centralized or decentralized economy? Do we follow the Bitcoin hype train and so on? You see, these are different examples and uh, I am here, trickster-like, want to expand your horizon in thinking about the traces we're leaving, we leave. It's not a question of uh, our wishing to exist post-mortem, it's the question of us being ready to measure our existence online and being able to be conscious about all our activities. Uh, and the second point here about digital immortality, it's uh, our relationship to end-of-life practices. These are not digital practices, not just digital practices, these are the practices uh, that regulate our leaving the world of living. If we look at this sociology of uh, uh, dying or anthropology of dying, uh, we will find that every culture has a certain practices and activities related to passing away and grieving, uh, mourning, uh, the trauma experience and so on. These practices are contextual, contextual and uh, they cannot be imagined outside of context. They are closely linked to the ideas of the norm, of the available and of the acceptable. Uh, talking about the digital field, uh, as we did with the digital trace, we cannot equate digital dying with physical dying. Because, to a large degree, talking about digital death, we mean the continuation of social life after the physical dying. When our accounts live on, when, based on our discussions with friends, our friends create chatbots, continuing to talk to them after our death, when there are special social networks that augment the basic social network and siphon information about you to create this continuous account which will be independent, not requiring a curator. Everything that I mentioned here is a continuation of the representations that you create while you're alive. And even if you put them all together, they are not equal to your personality because your personality cannot imagine what you are really in, in uh, quotation marks because this really is not imaginable really so if we consider what uh, cultural practices of physical or trivial if you wish death are normal in case of digital dying it's not clear what is normal and normative uh, about ceasing to exist online my favorite uh, example is the wake. We can all imagine this, even if we are not religious, what a wake is, uh, how it is fixed in the calendar of mourning, uh, what's the difference in wakes uh, in different cultures, it's not a terra incognita for us. But as soon as we consider a person dying and their online trace being around, uh, the question arises how to represent this online, how to represent this classical practice, traditional ritual of wake. The simplest example is what I really often discuss with people, is the situation when a person is dead and their account is still there and people visit this account with their timeline uh, in certain, on certain dates and they write messages to them coming back to the situation of this person being alive, uh, saying farewell, leaving memorial posts, adding photos from the life of this person, adding to this calendar circle of uh, grief. 
So if you can say that in both traditional and uh, modern situations the mourning is highly normalized, here you see people coming back to their pain and grief, which makes us think about whether it's possible that the digital grief is more therapeutically uh, useful than the traditional physical grief, which is uh, somehow uh, codified and canonized in the religious cultures. And so we begin to think about the quality of afterlife existence that is somehow determined by these practices. And so we find volatility here, because the digital begins finding their own patterns, their own logic in this. And so the humanity in this debate between technicism and humanism, technology and humanity, needs to find a way of adjusting this technology to themselves. Because if you follow, for example, the stories of big acts of terror or other mass atrocities, you find this uh, interest of people uh, in how the digital affects traditional practices. How do we mourn? How do we grieve? How do we bury these people? And these are questions without answers. Next, what affects the afterlife status is the consideration of whether technology is uh, considerate about human feelings. Uh, and one sociologist has now developed this idea of death-sensitive network. Although technology is intolerant towards real human existence and experience, still we can find this uh, idea of technology which is adjusted to the existing experience of uh, mourning, where technology is not going to criticize you for not mourning in the correct way, where some therapeutical functions could be introduced so that people will believe that they don't visit social networks in order to break the circle of happiness with people posting pets and so on, and this individual mourning at the same time, uh, so that technology allows them to grieve in a more normative way. And of course, as uh, uh, there are studies of human-computer interfaces and uh, in immediate in interaction between human and machine, uh, we can think about whether the computer becomes a therapeutic agent in the mixed reality, where the offline and online worlds are not separate. Maybe it can be useful to delegate to the machine uh, the, solution to not o the solution not only of the simple algorithmic problems, but of more complex problems. If we sum it all up, then we see that the answer to the question what digital immortality is uh, depends on how an individual reflects the practices uh, of the end of life and whether the individual is able, is uh, uh, ready to delegate uh, the right, the intention and the opportunity to regulate uh, the posthumous existence to the machine. And in fact, the technological opportunities for digital immortality are quite numerous. And I think the last point that I mentioned here, the death of, uh, the death of uh, objects, has been described a lot, because philosophers see that digital death is not about the living, because the living is not present in the digital space. Even if the individual is still alive, their account may die, their living component uh, is not there anymore, but the account keeps living. And so the scariest thing online, which uh, is connected to the question whether I am living or not, is the death of things, the death of the software, because the technology moves on and the software gets obsolete. 
следует в сети. And maybe people believe that death online is only for them, but in fact uh, it's just because they don't think that the digital uh, being is not a living being, which functions, which lives, which uh, occupies certain living space. But when we think about what really concerns people is planning their own dying, it's uh, leaving trace in others' life, and it's their reanimating the beloved dead. And here we get back to this idea of the infinite graveyard occupied by those that are curated by the living, people who are forced to exist because they are needed. Uh, by those who want to talk to them. Or maybe we have this infinite number of multiplying uh, bots and uh, other uh, pretending to be living. And here I've got uh, an example that tells us a lot about the ethics of uh, online dying. It's the example of the dead bot developed by the son who wanted to record uh, infinitely many conversations with his father. His father had terminal cancer. It was clear that he's not going to survive, and so his son uh, recorded a lot of conversations with him, and they built an archive of audio files. Later on, it was clear that these audio files were dead weight, as, uh, you know, vinyl discs vinyl records because they are hermetic, they're not interactive, you can't communicate with them. And then the son of this dead father came up with this unethical idea, as we would think. He asked the father and the whole family, uh, while the father was still alive, whether he had his permission to not only digitize the data, but to build a bot based on the data, which will speak with the father's voice. It will be active, it will be able to talk to the relatives uh, when they are in pain, when they are suffering, to share their experience. And all the participants of the discussion agreed to this, and that's how this non-profit, not-for-wide audience bought. This bot works for this family, it's not just a memory, but rather it's a working conversation system, system for communicating with the dead. Uh, it substitutes reading his diaries or looking at photos. And this chatbot in, in the future can become an interesting source uh, of reflection uh, on the point how much people are able to think, are ready to think about death when they got a copy of the dead, and whether this copy does not become this scary thing that Baudrillard mentioned, the simulacrum, when death becomes a simulacrum. I think uh, this whole uh, discussion is interesting not just because we can fixate endlessly uh, on these hysterical uh, questions, whether we want to see digital zombies all over the internet because we keep on dying and the dead accounts are moving, uh, are living on, or maybe uh, the digital space will be filled and overfilled with memories and uh, crude outlines of dead people which we are going to use instead of our own living memory. The biggest question here, and I think it's important here, uh, when we think about the future and preserving uh, volatile things, this question is, what do we believe to be death and what do we believe to be life in this digital world? What do we see as dying, moving to the non-being, and uh, breaking down, and what do we consider as a different existent, existence? And do we need to keep this binary opposition of life and death when we have technologies that allow us to archive 
document and re-actualize any kind of content. And everything which is living can be transferred, transformed into content. And so the main point in this discussion to me is that in the digital age which programs our experience and practices, every person can take this liberating move and consider for themselves what is life and death for them, what they can consider as the end, as the destruction, and what is a transformation to something qualitatively different. And this is not just about things we're used to, this is also about ourselves. And the fact that we can uh, have our own opinion on these ontological questions is a radical degree of liberty, a degree of freedom, which technology provides us, even if it's a big brother. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? Please. Good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. Could you elaborate a bit more about the common and different things between these practices and what we saw in the traditional societies? You know, this talking to the dead father, this doppelganger instead of the dead relative, it looks exotic to us, but this is, at least superficially, the thing that happened, you know, hundred years ago, and you've mentioned the ritual of wake and so on. You know, there are two problems here. Number one is that we call different things with the same words, and we call different things, for example, wake. And here we have a thing very similar to selfies. Many people are not ready to see a selfie uh, like a just regular photo. There is a methodolo methodological debate here. Coming back to our topic, I think that it's important that it's not always that people reproduce their traditional logic online, the logic of grief, mourning and remembrance. They don't always follow the tradition living in them, it's not always reflected upon. And examples to these, uh, interesting examples could be uh, these more, more radical demonstrations of pain and trauma, for example, I know people, I follow people who every year, for many years, visit somebody's personal page and they write things to them. Or maybe people tell me that they cannot unfriend a dead friend and they provide us with a lot of explanations, cynical or non-cynical. Like, I cannot unfriend somebody because death is not a... Uh, a reason for stopping being the friends. Uh, death does not change that, they're still my friend. Other people say, Facebook is my working space, and I will unfriend this individual because they're taking up somebody else's place, somebody who is more useful. And uh, still others say that this friend's account was not public, and I will remove this from person from my friends, uh, I would remove them uh, because their photo would be too painful to see, but if I unfriend them, I will not be able to see this person at all. I need to see them somehow. So in this situation, an individual is ready to agree that they have delegated their memory to this person's social network account. And so not seeing the photo means this photo not existing. And so these di different uh, explanations are not about these people being callous or cynical, rather they show us how individually they built their own trajectories of grief. A student of mine, some students of mine told me about a pet's account, a dog's account in the Instagram, and then they had this ethical issue whether to keep it or not, although this is an object, both the account and the dog are something which is not as immediately personal as uh, a dead friend, and still it was there. 
Okay, one more question here. Uh, please give Lev the mic. <coughs> Oksana, it was beautiful and witty and uh, unsettling, it was uncanny, uh, but the only thing that uh, I see was lacking here, this topic of death and ritual and life after death, uh, as contrasted to Christianity and so on. Um, this is one of the most important subjects in human culture, and now it's uh, uncertain, you know, uh, with people getting the digital sarcophagus or something. But you didn't uh, reference anything in history are you going to introduce them? Yes, this is a topic for separate discussion, because there is a lot of those things, but you seem to be studying those as well. But maybe we could find parallels in history to this, and this could be fruitful. Yes, one of my favorite examples is the virtual graveyard. Such virtual graveyards are created uh, mainly for pets, not for humans, but there is a case in Russia, which might be interesting to you, uh, that tells us a lot about the relationship between the offline and the online world. In the Russian culture, there is a big issue with pet cemeteries. They are not very le legitimate in the culture. So, uh, more and more death. Yeah. So, uh, people who bury pets, they are not criminals, but they are not fully legitimate or legal. And so to change this, such enthusiasts came around that they uh, that create virtual pet cemeteries. Here the online world substitutes the offline solutions. They create something which is legitimate off online uh, while not being legitimate offline. So here the online world is solving uh, problems that are not available to solve in the real world. And such examples can be very numerous. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and uh, now I'd like to thank you all for your patience. And now the last presenter for today, the last speaker uh, in today's discussion is Pavel Park, uh, who works in this odious company called Google. And uh, so that we don't end anything with the subject of death, I will be very traditionalist about this. Pavel is going to talk to us uh, about the AI and uh, what it means for artists about experiments and processes launched by Google uh, trying to attract uh, artists and combine artistic practices with AI. And so, not to waste your time after the presentation, I'd like to thank you all for coming, for uh, not uh, migrating en masse from here, for sitting here and and listening and participating, and I think this is the type of event where you really can enjoy uh, from talking on important topics uh, about the world around us. And I'd like to remind you once again that the third episode launches uh, July the 19th. Ryoji Kede, come to Garage. Thank you. Good evening, thank you for coming and I'm so happy uh, to see you. I hope that uh, I'll just take 20 minutes of your time. I'm going to show you some pictures, some GIFs, uh, just to mention that I've been working for Google uh, about 11 years and it means uh, that uh, I, uh, I have seen uh, how uh, the world turned mobile. Uh, we uh, 
said that we are a mobile company and it means that we wanted to invest most of things into mobile devices. So in 2005-2013 you can see how people met uh, the Pope and uh, the, there's obvious difference. Uh, everybody is holding their phones in 2013 and uh, as to uh, uh, Russia 50 billion dollars uh, were uh, generated uh, by mobile phones into Russian GDP uh, uh, and we are no longer uh, uh, mobile first company now we are AI first company it means that we're working on uh, AI extensively since we are in garage museum um, who can recognize this painting I'd love to mention uh, um, uh, uh, Nuts piece. Uh, so, bingo, excellent, and I'm sure that uh, uh, you're, you're going to be great. Uh, it's true, this is uh, artificial intelligence that uh, scans all Rembrandt's works, identified all the patterns, uh, and uh, uh, created the image uh, which. Um, uh, uh, no, which would be taken as Rembrandt's work. Uh, do you remember the uh, uh, film uh, She uh, in uh, Her in 2013? Uh, so this uh, melancholic poet, uh, this uh, was released five years ago. Uh, was, it uh, seemed utopia, but now everybody can uh, do this. So it means that all the changes take place uh, um, uh, very fast. So Google AI uh, might look like this. This is our idea of what it looks like, but it doesn't really matter how it's going to look. Uh, the main, main idea is how it's going to help and uh, assist us. So, uh, Sundar Pichai said that uh, machine learning is a key, a new approach to uh, problem solving that uh, we face today. So, you probably feel annoyed when Uber or other uh, taxi service don't, uh, doesn't tell you the right address or the the uh, location um, where the driver is and it means that uh, uh, all these back-end algorithms uh, uh, are using machine learning extensively. Uh, many uh, people uh, mix, uh, mix up uh, the um, concepts of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, actually, artificial intelligence is a very wide term, is a very wide no uh, concept. Uh, for example, if you want your teapot to be hot when you come home, Yes, it has to be connected to some assistant or application, so it remembers the time when you come home. And basically, this is the science how to um, make things smart and how to help people um, solve their problems. Now, machine learning is a method of uh, AI work when algorithms uh, learn uh, uh, using the examples and not uh, the established rules in deep learning. Um, uh, is just like our is the work um, that uh, our brain does. For example, this is easy to recognize. A fi uh, that was a fish, but as to kitten or ice cream or chihuahua or muffin, it's more difficult to recognize. For example, I had um, uh, Belgium uh, grief on. Uh, it's easy um, uh, to recognize. Uh, but what if uh, this is is a commandor uh, breed of dog. For example, uh, what would be the probability or the likelihood of our uh, um, uh, machine uh, site recognition that this is the dog and not a broom? I'm not uh, um, uh, going to uh, uh, keep you uh, waiting. 90% uh, uh, of recognition. So it recognizes dog pretty well. Uh, as to broom, um, uh, it's more difficult difficult uh, for the machine to recognize. And uh, how does it work? Uh, do, do you see that uh, layer? Uh, actually, uh, do you see that uh, um, uh, thing? Uh, actually, I didn't, I couldn't recognize that it was a dog in that basket. Uh, so, 
all these uh, uh, points uh, represent neurons and uh, uh, there is a binary vector one zero uh, one zero then it is multiplied with all the neurons and then they uh, identify whether it's a dog or a cat uh, 100% precision and now Tom Hanks or Bill Murray Sorry, um, this is Bill Murray, but it's not that obvious. Do you agree? Over 99% uh, 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 is the precision of recognition. And yes, this is Bill, uh, Bill Murray. It means that the machine can see more details than the human eye does. And it, it can be used for all human uh, life uh, um, fields. For example, we use it for uh, medical science, diagnostics, and uh, forecasting different diseases, just using the re eye retina. And uh, uh, for example, uh, sometimes highly qualified specialists can't do this. And now you can just send photos of eye retina and um, the machine will uh, give you a result, uh, which is uh, very precise. Now, um, this is not magic and uh, it involved a lot of hard work. Actually, whenever we talk to our partners, our industrial partners, uh, you know, sometimes you give a lot of data that has been organized. When you make all the calculations, you will get a magic result results uh, um, at the end but it's not like that uh, uh, the, our partners different uh, brands cannot get all the benefits uh, from our cloud platforms unless you work following this uh, pattern you have uh, a large uh, computational resources you have a lot of experts uh, in machine learning uh, and you have spent a lot of time marking all the data that you're going to use for learning so it means that, that those uh, magical uh, results uh, are the consequences uh, of really uh, hard uh, work. Uh, now, speaking uh, about uh, the um, uh, volumes uh, of uh, computer uh, data uh, um, uh, that are required uh, to process uh, those huge uh, masses uh, of uh, data, uh, uh, the, there are many business cases uh, that show that uh, artificial uh, intelligence, uh, for example, one and go up, uh, play, uh, alpha go play, um, because it's so complicated because it's impossible to calculate uh, uh, all these um, uh, uh, goals. Uh, you know, uh, the number of combinations, uh, 10, uh, um, uh, 72. Uh, multi, uh, to the power of 72. And when uh, um, uh, we uh, ask, the, when we set down uh, computers uh, um, uh, um, uh, to play together, it uh, uh, lost uh, to the other, uh, one computer um, uh, lost to the other computer 100 to 0. So when we started using these algorithms, uh, um, uh, actually, uh, we are using machine learning uh, for all the Google services and you uh, uh, see them every day without realizing that. And uh, why uh, does vision help? Uh, why does computer vision help you to find a way? For example, you probably uh, have been to Istanbul and um, you know how difficult it is to find the right place because uh, all these uh, um, uh, streets look crooked and now all these uh, uh, images have been processed by our computers and so all the maps have been enriched with the right uh, content so that you could find all sorts of points that you need and of course it's for people for example here you can see some farmers from Japan they grow cucumbers and computer uh, cloud uh, solutions uh, save a lot of their time. For example, here they uh, use uh, uh, these models to uh, sort uh, uh, the cucumbers uh, depending on the class. So there are nine classes or nine categories of cucumbers. Usually mothers had to do all this work and this depended on a large of accumulated experience. And of course uh, the profit depends on that. And seasonal workers 
parents uh, cannot help with that because they cannot develop the right skills uh, to sort out all those cucumbers. So this model and the, the right separating tool help them to do it. And so uh, let's get back to art now. This was a beautiful GIF that described uh, the, uh, our application. Sorry, I've been uh, up uh, since 7 a.m. in the morning. Who can recognize this thing in virtual reality that uh, you can draw? Oculus Swive, you know, when you uh, uh, just uh, paint uh, in space, uh, uh, like um, you paint a mermaid. Uh, and now let's get back to art. We have great uh, projects, Google Arts and Culture, and I would like to thank the organizers um, of this event. Um, you know, they decided to invite Google representative, even though we are not about culture. But you know, it was uh, such a great event when speakers were talking about art and technology, so they were moving from one thing to another gradually so I think it was a great idea to bring us all together here so thank you uh, you were speaking about conservation of art how to make it more um, accessible uh, these are the initiatives uh, that uh, we are trying to support uh, with our technologies and uh, we would like to make sure uh, all this uh, would be accessible to a very broad audience um, you probably have seen how life tech uh, uh, work. I could uh, show it live uh, if we could connect to the internet, but basically these are different uh, uh, pieces of information and images that have been processed, um, that have been digitized and scanned. First we scan them, um, then we uh, separated, uh, divided them into objects, and then we tagged all of these. So, for example, using the tag lady, you can um, extract a huge mass of images um, uh, where um, uh, you can say a girl uh, uh, that would uh, um, uh, be uh, uh, conformant to the uh, tags. So basically it's about experimenting with machine learning opportunities, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So you can see a lot of works. The, uh, uh, I, I can't use demo mode, but I hope you can check it later. So this is a cloud of all the uh, pictures that we have in our collection. More than 650 partners all over the world uh, let us scan these uh, pieces in, uh, in their expositions. Uh, so we use different technologies and methods uh, uh, to to uh, let our users uh, get to know or sort uh, uh, these uh, pieces depending on the years, depending on the colors, uh, or uh, select some uh, um, uh, pictures for your room uh, depending on the colors you need. And this is one of my favorite experiments uh, that uh, lets you uh, choose um, any of two objects uh, and see the connection between these two images based on our scanned collection. I don't remember the artist's name. I can't uh, tell you his name, unfortunately, sorry. Uh, but it wasn't done by Google programmers. It's a digital artist that works with this uh, organization. Yeah, that's what I wanted to mention. Yeah, as, uh, I actually, this is uh, what I wanted uh, to say at the end, uh, but it's a very good and right comment because, you know, um, uh, of course, all these technologies are useless without the experts, uh, without the people that specialize in different uh, um, fields. So these platforms are open. That's why I uh, was grateful for this opportunity to talk to this audience. I understand 
that you are uh, you know much more about art and uh, so maybe now that you have seen this platform you might want uh, to um, uh, do something uh, to recreate some experiment uh, or maybe make uh, your dream come true so it's all for you uh, uh, it only depends on your imagination and another project uh, that is example an example of collaboration between a programmer and digital artist is a muse uh, project these are some sketches uh, you can see how we model different postures and for example take a look at this uh, um, image what does it look like more or less this is goya but uh, your idea was right uh, uh, we got a lot of works uh, uh, with the images of girls that could be considered muses and they were all uh, uh, divided into patterns uh, you know we had many more images than you can see here and then we let artificial intelligence create works based on those patterns and uh, of course these are early years uh, uh, it's not something you want to hang on your wall, but basically it uh, shows you uh, what the machine can do up after processing a lot of materials. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the artist did a live performance using this, so the artist could take any uh, posture and the machine uh, would be drawing um, the art object. Uh, so, yes, this was a performance. I don't know whether this can be called art or not, but this is something our technologies can do now. So, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, thank you for staying until the end, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions uh, if we have time and if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Does it work? My microphone, yes. Uh, it's been very useful uh, that uh, you came, and uh, you probably know that uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, has become more and uh, more and more important uh, in culture. So machine learning uh, has its own paradigms. Uh, uh, when we give a lot of examples to the machine, so the machine uh, identifies certain pattern, patterns and then uh, create new objects in the same uh, uh, style, can classify the things. Uh, and this has been uh, discussed uh, uh, a lot recently. But uh, can this paradigm generate something completely new? You know, maybe my question doesn't sound right, maybe it's the wrong question, but still, if you can... Uh, uh, share some uh, thoughts uh, that you have since you are much closer to this m machine body. You know, in the 60s and 70s, artists used different algorithms. Uh, they generated a lot of abstract objects and music. Now uh, we are having this uh, paradigm of machine learning, but we teach this machine uh, what, uh, the, what we have. Uh, so my, the question uh, is whether this machine can can do something completely different? I think uh, the uh, answer is obvious and it's uh, hidden in your uh, question. Uh, so you mean uh, some, uh, uh, you mean, well, neural uh, networks uh, um, are useless without human input. Uh, so it, uh, it depends on your imagination. For example, when uh, you uh, ask your questions, uh, uh, it's very important for the machine uh, and the result will depend on that. Of course, uh, new entities will appear and it's only... Uh, the matter of audience uh, and criticism whether those entities would be considered as art objects or not. I can give you another example. Um, 
the the robots did some advertising and so there was a competition art director against artificial intelligence you can find this video sport on the internet so no words just a very strange characters that look something in between dog and a person uh, well and many people liked it so it means that new entity appeared and this was a good uh, experiment a good example of a new entities uh, um, appearance are there any other questions thank you for coming thank you